instead of okay. just to make it really clear. <laughs> and then up above that, um, under agenda yeah. item three, there was no cu public comment returned to board. And I would like to see a, a short sentence in there that said OSBT requested revisions to the wording in the agreements. Just to reflect that the board did something more than having it returned to the board. And then um, on page two, under uh, Lindsay Sterling Crank's last name begins with a K. Good point. Yep. Yeah. <coughs> Anything else? Um, do we have a motion to approve the amended minutes? I move that we approve the minutes as amended. Second. All in favor? All right. That's unanimous. Um, the next is public comment for items not identified for public hearing. There aren't any items for public hearing, so if anyone wants to speak on any issue, now's the time to do so. And Leah tells me no one has signed up. Okay, then. Uh, then we'll close public comment, and Dan move to matters from the department. All right. Um, I've got a few informal matters that I think I will do after our, we'll get through the A through D. Um, so um, we're going to now turn things over to city utilities staff, who is going to provide the board and with an update on some uh, um, sewer line projects that are in the works that uh, that involve some OSMP lands and as well Brandon will uh, provide us with a quick update of where we're at in the process and where we're going over the next three or four months in terms of the South Boulder Creek flood mitigation project. So we'll, uh, there'll be a one slide and a brief update on where we're at with that. Uh, but with that I'll turn it over to Cole with uh, 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 City Utilities Department. Thanks Dan. So I'm Cole Sigmund, an engineering project manager in the Utilities Division of Public Works. Uh, can everyone hear me okay? Well, I'll check to see if your microphone is on. Okay. It is green. It is? Oh, sorry. You might just want to bend into it. Okay. <clears throat> uh, maybe I'll just move it slightly here. Thanks for giving us the opportunity for this update today. Um, our goals today are to give you an overview, first of all, of the wastewater collection system and to talk about two projects specifically, uh, two of four that were identified in our 2016 collection system master plan um, that will have impacts on open space. <clears throat> this slide has a map of the wastewater collection system on the right. <laughs> there are 360 miles of, of sewer pipe that appear in, in the green lines in the map. Um, if you'd like to later on, I'd be happy to show you uh, how to follow your own flesh um, <laughs> this, uh, this system conveys residents, um, conveys wastewater from residences and businesses in the city of Boulder out to the, uh, the water resource recovery facility. And um, the water, res water resource recovery facility is so named because it uh, recovers uh, fertilizer, energy, and water. So that water is discharged back into Boulder Creek as clean water. The good news is that the majority of the system is at, is uh, has plenty of capacity, um, and the thing that that causes capacity issues is are wet weather flows. When we say wet weather flows, um, it refers to a large volume of diluted wastewater flow that's conveyed in the collection system from the impact of what we call rainfall de derived inflow and infiltration. So rainwater that gets into the wastewater collection system, the sanitary sewer, through cracks and openings, that's unintentional. So we don't have a combined sewer system, but stormwater does unintentionally get in the system and it causes capacity issues. Um, what do those capacity issues look like and why are they important? Well, here are two very visual uh, examples of what a capacity issue looks like. So this is called a manhole surcharge. When the collection system isn't adequately, adequately sized for the flow, wastewater backs up um, out of the, the covers of manholes. This also happens in residences uh, where they don't have check valves on their, on their, um, their building sewer, uh, their, their private lateral, and, and their basements uh, can flood like many did in the 2013 flood. <laughs> Another issue in the system is that 
uh, many parts of the system are o uh, over 50 years old, especially the large parts of the system that were installed a long time ago are concrete pipe. Uh, this image is of a concrete pipe. And the interesting thing is it looks like a corrugated steel pipe, but when this was installed, it would have been very smooth. What's happened over time is that the harsh wastewater environment has corroded the concrete away um, so that the rebar in that pipe is exposed. So that's just a, a visual image of the internal corrosion that's happening. So the, many of these pipes are at the end of their useful life and need to be replaced. Um, as a matter of prioritization, uh, the, the 2016 master plan identified four of the highest priorities in the system. And these are, are circled here uh, from bottom uh, to top, uh, the baseline and foothills project, uh, the Arapahoe trunk sewer replacement project, the Goose Creek uh, trunk sewer replacement and rehabilitation project, and the main interceptor realignment project. All these uh, need to be upsized at least uh, to increase wet weather capacity. And two of these, as I mentioned, uh, will impact open space lands. This is a list of those projects, those four projects. Um, baseline is listed at the top, Baseline and Foothills Trunk Sewer Replacement Project, um, estimated dollars at $5 million, um, 1.8 miles, and temporary impacts of the, uh, from this project will be on Oliver and Burke One, which are OSMP properties along Baseline just west of South Boulder Creek. Um, the Interceptor Sewer Realign Realignment Project is a large project that basically goes from Butte Mill out to the Water Resource Recovery Facility, um, 3.1 3 miles in length, um, and there's going to be a new easement on the Saw Hill Ponds wildlife uh, area, and that state wildlife area has an open space and mountain parks management lease on it. Uh, the other two trunk sewer replacement projects will not have open space uh, resource impacts. <coughs> So this is an overview of the Baseline and Foothills Trunk Sewer Replacement Project. Uh, we'll be installing 15 to 27 inch pipe. Um, part of the project is up along the median of Foothills, um, and then it will be along Baseline Road within the city of Boulder, um, entering into the county uh, at the Burke, one, uh, Burke 2 property, and then connecting to the existing 36 inch inter interceptor that, that runs through the Oliver property. Um, four to five million dollars, um, and the construction is planned for next year or the following year. <coughs> um, the Burke One property and Oliver property um, have many uh, resources that have been identified through uh, collaboration, through investigation on the part of utilities consultants, and also collaboration with OSMP staff. So both properties are along the South Boulder Creek floodplain. They're irrigated cut pasture that serve as habitat for Pre Preble's Meadow Jumping Mouse and U Ladies Tresses Orchid, um, which has been documented on the Burke One property and the Burke Two property. Um, there's also a Howard Ditch crossing that's involved in the project. Project that, that photo on the right is of Howard Ditch as it runs through the Oliver property. Um, and there's uh, an OSMP agricultural lease. <coughs> this slide is uh, shows several examples of how uh, collaboration between utility staff and open space staff have resulted in a proposed alignment that uh, minimizes impacts on these open space properties. And so I wanted to tell this story by, uh, by looking at three examples. Uh, one is in red, uh, one is in orange, and I can use my, um, <coughs> if you can see my pointer here, this is the red line. The orange uh, is right here, and then there's a burgundy line up here. And so I'll start with the red line. Originally, we proposed um, heading off of Baseline onto the Burke 2 property, and that was because Baseline Road doesn't have shoulders in this area. It drops off on the north and south side. And uh, in the road, there are several, um, in the right of way, there are several uh, utility conflicts. There's a power line at the south, uh, the existing wastewater uh, trunk sewer. There's a water line, 24-inch transmission line in there. Uh, and there's a 16-inch main uh, for natural gas. And so being in the road means being in the middle of the road, which would result in, in about a month-long closure of Baseline Road. 
Um, after discussions with open space staff, uh, we together met with uh, Boulder County and the transportation engineer there agreed that the resources on the Burke 2 property merited this month long closure. And so we're moving forward with permitting within baseline for that portion of the alignment. Um, next, we'll move to the red. Um, this north-south portion of alignment is needed to chase grade, in other words, for the elevations to match up to, to connect to the, uh, to the existing sewer. Um, originally, that was proposed on the west side of Howard Ditch, um, crossing Howard Ditch and connecting to the existing interceptor. That's just a shorter run and, and less complex from ditch crossing standpoint. Um, and, and what we learned after doing wetland mapping is that there are significant wetlands in the area. Um, the Howard Ditch Crossing is not ideal. It's a state historic uh, ditch. And, and so what we proposed was uh, basically going on the other side of uh, the existing interceptor and the, the Howard Ditch. And so we'll be on the east side of both. Uh, the additional benefit that has is that we won't have to get a, uh, we won't be requesting a disposal for this project because the, the interceptor, the new pipe will live within our existing easement. Uh, the last one I'll talk about is the burgundy section. So uh, as I mentioned, the north-south alignment is needed to chase grade. And um, the elevations were um, such that we had to chase grade about 700 feet. We were able to cut that about in half by changing uh, the pipe diameter within baseline. And so uh, we were able to impact less of the Oliver property there. We'll handle the temporary impacts on that property through uh, a memorandum of understanding uh, between uh, the utilities division and open space mountain parks. Um, and this project will also undergo federal permitting, um, city of Boulder wetland permitting, and um, through that process, we'll survey the um, threatened species and uh, do a very careful job of uh, remediation and restoration. I'll move on to the next project here. Uh, here's a slide that, is, uh, that shows the main interceptor sewer realignment. Um, this project will involve rehabilitating 2.6 miles of the existing interceptor, uh, that's 42 inch and then installing 2.4 miles of new interceptor uh, that may be up to as, as um, large as 66 inch. That's a $35 million project that's slated for 22, 2022 to 2024 construction. You can see the purple line um, is our existing interceptor sewer and its proximity to Boulder <coughs> Creek is another issue. So it's under capacity, it has internal corrosion issues that I showed you. It's also prone to floodwaters of Boulder Creek. And uh, we've done some point repairs uh, because of some, some real exposure on that section. So the, the proposed alignment in brown, um, there's a narrative uh, on how we got to that alignment and, and why it is that we're sort of keeping both. And I'd like to tell you that now. So the original alternatives analysis had, had basically three options. Um, the black line is the purple line you saw before, so it, the, ex the existing interceptor sewer uh, running uh, through here. There was a northern line alignment that was considered. Um, there are two creek crossings and it goes through the Fort Chambers Poor Farm o OSMP property um, and a, a private property. And so for, for many reasons we did not select that one. And so an alignment was proposed along the RTD corridor and um, it was the one that ended up getting proposed was a, a hybrid that spent some time on the RTD right of way and then some time um, on some uh, Colorado Parks and Wildlife trails that are managed by Open Space Mountain Parks. Uh, then the third one was at the south, uh, the Valmont uh, alignment, which would involve uh, a very long closure of Valmont Road and uh, would be um, monumentally expensive. So when, when we proposed this to the county, one of the things they said is, okay, you can, you know, we, we can approve this on a, on a few conditions. A couple important things happened. They, they wanted us to abandon the section of the existing interceptor, interceptor that we were no longer using. Uh, that was problematic because there are some flows coming in from the north that you can see uh, in our, this is our asset management tool here. This is the four mile trunk sewer, as we call it, and it carries about 10% of the city's flow. And so that was pretty significant. Um, the other thing that happened is that we weren't able to get agreement from RTD on a parallel alignment within their right-of-way. 
Uh, they say they're going to put tr two tracks there, um, and we have no way to contest that. It's their land. Um, so we propose now a, uh, a perpendicular crossing of the RTD right of way. <clears throat> that sent us into uh, comprehensive alternatives analysis. One of the issues what we wanted to, to address is how do we get that four mile trunk sewer flow um, into the system with a southern alignment? So uh, there are many, many nodes on this map. And uh, we, we basically selected nodes based on uh, property, different properties, different alignments, and we combined the nodes into different alternatives. Uh, this comprehensive alternatives analysis was shared with you in detail. Um, I'd be happy to talk through it at uh, more length at a separate occasion, but um, suffice it to say that um, through collaboration with open space staff, uh, we landed on an alternative that was a hybrid option that allowed us to be in the south um, without uh, building a lift station. Uh, the lift station appears here on the Strati Klein OSMP property. It would be there or around that property. Um, and the, the, so the current plan is to follow Valmont, come up 61st, uh, go along the rear of properties along the RTD right of way, cross the RTD right of way perpendicularly, come along the Keeter Hogan property, um, and then um, join with the uh, CPW owned Saw Hill Ponds State Wildlife Area that Open Space manages, um, and then join onto a trail. Uh, along the Walden Ponds County open space area and connect to the water resources, uh, water resource recovery facility at its uh, southwest corner. <coughs> um, an important part of this is that we'd keep a portion of the inter existing interceptor sewer. Um, not only would we keep it from 61st up to the plant, we'd also find benefit in keeping the rest of it basically down to Valmont, which provides us with a future opportunity for redundancy that we've never had on this critical line. Um, one thing I'd like to point out on this slide is this property here. So you can see the property line. This is the, this is the Saw Hill Ponds SWA uh, all along here, and you can see the alignment within it. <clears throat> Here's a different map of the Saw Hill Ponds area. This is from OSMP's website and it shows the trails in Saw Hill Ponds, and then it shows the trails in Walden Ponds, the county open space area. Um, that area is accessed uh, in two ways. One of them is through city property um, where the water resource recovery facility is. Um, the, there are a lot of resources on this property as well. Um, the pond and wetland habitat dominate. Um, it, there are 500 feet of the proposed alignment that are uh, Prebles Meadow Jumping Mouse habitat. There's uh, an osprey nest, so, so resulting seasonal rapture closure, raptor closures, um, and there are um, recreational trails. Um, finally, there are ditch crossings. Uh, Butte Mill Ditch and Green Ditch are, uh, are in that area, and so there'll be some coordination uh, from staff there. <clears throat> so I wanted to take a moment to talk about how the resources in that area will be protected, and there are a few regulatory um, bodies in place and, and processes in place that will protect the area. Um, the first is is not um, uh, a hard regulatory one, and it's just inter interdepartmental collaboration between utilities and open space. We'll continue that. It's been meaningful in the past, and, and we have hopes that it'll continue to be uh, a good way to minimize impacts on lands and still allow for utility priorities. Um, city wetland regulations, including remedi remediation requirements, uh, are expected. Even though this is not in the city, uh, we will still go through the City of Boulder's wetland uh, permitting process. There will also be a stormwater management plan, which defines things like how uh, construction impacts will be limited to the construction area, how uh, water quality in the ponds will be preserved, that kind of thing. And then. Like the Carter Lake Pipeline project that is proceeding with construction right now, we expect uh, many conditions of approval. Uh, that project had 34 condition, conditions of approval that addressed um, resource issues, uh, ecological, cultural, hydrologic. Um, it, it also, because, and, and this is another similarity between the Carter Lake Pipeline project and the main interceptor sewer replacement project, is, is that the county open space is, is also impacted, and so the county will likely extend requirements that they have for their own open space into the, open, the, the property that's managed by city open space. 
So summary comments are that uh, interdepartmental collaboration minimizes unavoidable OSMP land and resource impacts and that OSMP resources will be protected. Um, with that, I'm happy to answer questions now uh, or later and I've just uh, included two summary of, uh, a summary of both of the, the projects on the right here. So could you or, or Don or someone uh, go into a little more detail on the anticipated impacts that on the uh, baseline foothills one, you said there were temporary, or no, Burke Oliver, you said there were temporary impacts. What, what are those? Right, and I think a good way to explain that will be go back, go, would be to go back to this figure. And so the black line is the proposed alignment. Uh, I'll point out here, here's the Oliver property, here's the property line, Howard Ditch is right here. Um, there's an access to that property that's not shown here. It's a, a driveway to the old house that was there. And so this would be an open cut installation of a 24 inch sewer line. Um, it will be um, um, sort of intensified construction. In other words, it, we, wouldn't, we wouldn't be digging down um, and having uh, uh, vehicles drive along there. Uh, it would be um, shored up engineered shoring for the uh, basically pointed uh, excavation for this line. And so in that way, um, um, the construction, the excavation impacts would be minimized. There's also a draft um, memorandum of understanding that would require our contractor to do, um, you know, extensive remediation uh, following construction, things like, uh, um, managing the topsoil separately and putting it back and, and doing, you know, careful reseeding. Um, John, would you like to speak to this too? Um, <clears throat> sure, John Potter, Resource and Stewardship Manager. Uh, and Dave, I would just mention that staff have worked very closely on um, First, I, uh, locating this in an area with, with much lower resource value than where it was originally planned. We feel like um, utility staff has been very, very, has worked very closely with us to mitigate all, all of um, staff's concerns on resource impacts here on this property, and so we're fully supportive of, of this, uh, this layout. So is the black line actually on open space in Mountain Park's property? It is. It, so the Oliver property. How far property, does it go to the, further to the east? The property extends further to the east, yes. And so the, oh, okay. the, if you imagine that property, um, this, this pipe would be to the left of the driveway to the old house, the house that was demolished when that property was purchased in 2017. Yeah, there, um, there used to be a residence uh, to the east, and so that's why there's probably less value in this area from a resource standpoint. It's been, been restored in the process of being restored, but the area right along the ditch on this, on the east side of the ditch, is not as big a concern as yeah. where it was located on the west side. So Thank you. So the temporary impacts are basically construction impacts? Correct. So for both of these, and the answer may be different because I'm assuming the interceptor is, uh, um, is a wider pipe, how wide is the area of the disturbance? How much ground do you have to dig up in order to put the pipe in? Right, and so the, the MOU in, in this area uh, describes a 50-foot um, sort of temporary access what we'd usually call a temporary easement, although when we both own and are requesting an easement on the land, it, it's not an easement, it's just, you know, an MOU. And so 50 feet here um, on the other project, it is a much bigger pipe. And so we're requesting 100 feet um, and of, of um, from CP, on the CPW property, we're, we're requesting 100 feet of temporary and 50 feet of permanent easement. And does the, do those two figures represent the area that will literally be dug up or does some of that include where the uh, equipment might go, and so that isn't, I realize the equipment has impacts, but, or is some of that, um, the equipment goes there and then you dig up a, a smaller area to actually drop the pipe in the ground. That's exactly right. So the, the actual excavation is a very small portion of both of those figures, uh, especially in this case where we're doing the engineered shoring, the, the actual excavation will only be about six feet in width. 
Um, but the 50 feet includes, you know, driving. It includes, uh, you know, where we'd want to put the topsoil, for example, um, uh, where we lay the pipe as it gets installed, um, things like that. So, and the easement, that, to, to elaborate, the easement that you referred to, I gather on that open space property, uh, the utilities department already has an easement for a pipeline. Correct. So, the so you're, what you're proposing to do is within the boundaries of the exist, the existing easement is wide enough to reach. Right. So the permanent impact of the, the sewer being underneath open space um, will be within the existing 25 foot easement, but the temporary impact for construction will be a little wider than that. And so that's why this MOU needs to exist uh, for, for us to access that area. Um, so, and it's important to, to talk about the difference between, so this is OSMP fee property uh, where utilities had an easement before OSMP bought it. And so that 25 foot easement is, is, is there. And if we, needed, if we needed to put a pipe outside of our existing easement, that would likely be a disposal and we'd be having a different conversation uh, with the board. Um, on the, in the other case, on the CPW owned property, the proposal is to um, to do a separate lease to the one that that is our, that CPW already has with the city of Boulder. The separate lease would cover uh, temporary and permanent utilities easements. That with the CPW. That that would be directly between the city and CPW, and, and so the city would have two uh, agreements with CPW: one a management lease and one a utilities easement. So has CPW been involved in the conversations? They have. So can I, because um, I think the disposal questions are probably different. The judgment on the, the baseline, on the, uh, that portion of the baseline project is that because the construction activity is temporary, uh, there's no need to dispose of the land even though it's outside of the utilities current easement. That is, if, and essentially, the, the view is that if there's a temporary construction activity on open space land, there's not, viewing that that's not a disposal situation, that's um, a temporary sort of non-exclusive license. Um, yeah, it was pretty close to what, what already exists, but the, the understanding was before we acquired this property, and the resource value is very low. We consider it low in that area, so. Okay. But you're and, right, Tom. Okay. And, and so what will it look like when all is said and done? So the, the ideal will be for it to look almost exactly the same, with the exception of a couple manholes that are fairly nondescript. Um, in the case of CPW land, um, the manholes will exist uh, along existing recreational trails, and, um, and they have already uh, requested that the manholes not be visible. And so normally, you know, to respond to emergencies and to respond to do normal maintenance, um, of course, our, our maintenance crews like to be able to see the manholes. <laughs> um, and but in in ex, you know in certain cases, we're willing to make uh, exceptions to that, and and that we've already agreed to do that with CPW. In this property, the, the same could be true, although it's not a gravel pathway, and so if we're, if we're planting grass, it would be very hard to plant grass over a manhole lid. So the expectation would be for the manhole lids to be visible on the surface. But you can see that there's, you know, there, in addition to the existing ones, there'll just be two that are proposed w within the property. Um, can I, the second half of my question, on the, the disposal on the interceptor in the sawhill area, that's land that's, or the land that you're focusing on is land that's owned by the state, currently managed by the city, and for that there's no easement that the utilities department can sort of piggyback off of. You're making the judgment that it's not a disposal because we manage the property but don't own it? The state owns the property. We have a management lease. That should not change, or it may change in a very minor way. Um, there's no, there, there was nothing there purchased with open space dollars, so we didn't see it as a disposal issue. All right, so the, the point would be, the dis I was just sort of thinking through the distinction between that and Long's Garden, which we wouldn't own either, is that the, 
the conservation easements that we have on lots of properties are paid for with open space dollars. Correct. They usually are. Sometimes they're free, but they're usually paid for with open space dollars. Or is this where you think you're thinking that it's not open space lands in the meaning of the charter because we just manage it? Right. I believe it's a 30-year lease. Yeah. I don't know. If, yeah. Yeah. Okay, I want to think about that, but uh, okay. Well, uh, while you're uh, thinking, yeah, yeah. Uh, I want to continue sure, on a, a question on Sawhill. Um, you used a word, and I'm sorry I didn't jot it down, um, about the, the, I think you said access and the right-of-way in Sawhill of the sewer line, that you would retain what was the word you used? So what we're requesting from CPW is uh, a 100 foot temporary utilities easement that would be for construction and, and then a 50 foot permanent easement. Okay. And the permanent easement, as I understand it, is where there is a trail now, right? Uh, for the most part, that's true. So how does a sewer easement and a trail come together? Um, they're, they're very compatible uses of land, in, in my opinion. And so you, you might imagine the, the trail being gravel, and so construction would, would basically remove the trail, yep. install the pipe, put the trail back. Um, in this case, you wouldn't even be able to find the manholes. We'll be able to find them, of course, right. with metal detectors and, and GPS, um, but uh, recreational users of the trail won't be able to identify that there's a sewer underneath the trail. So your easement will be under the trail? Um, the easement, the reason for a permanent easement is that it gives us access in perpetuity um, to from that. From the surface. From the surface. Yeah. And so if we need, if, for example, if, if s the system surcharges or for preventative maintenance to prevent the system from surcharging, for example, uh, occasionally we access those man manholes. We're talking once, twice a year. On a, on a line like this, uh, maybe not even that. And so it's, it's infrequent uh, access, um, but it's important that city utility staff does have access, permanent access to the area. I have two questions. On Burke 2, um, you, there was some mention of a, a previously impacted what was a prior road. Um, can you just describe specifically how, is this, being put where the previous impact was, beside it, how are those things relational? So um, the, the, the land, the properties, let's just be clear. So Burke 2 was on the original design. The, the current proposed design does not have any impacts on Burke 2. Oh, okay. The impact on Burke 1 is this little section of pipe right here at the very bottom that connects um, the, the new pipe that'll be within Baseline Road <coughs> to the existing pipe that runs through the Burke One property. So, so help me understand how the pre-existing road plays into that. Um, I'm not sure what pre-existing road you're... you're <coughs> you, you may be referring a, to the driveway, driveway on the Oliver like, property. Yeah. Oh, oh, Oliver. So, so on the Oliver property, the Oliver pro property was acquired in 2017. At the time of acquisition, um, there was a house there. And so as you were driving along Baseline Road, uh, headed eastbound on the left, you know, beautiful pasture, Burke Two property, uh, Howard Ditch, Oliver property, it was a residence. And very recently it became open space land. And so this is, I think, one of the reasons why it's considered not to have as high of ecological value. It also has a driveway, and that, that driveway is, is used by the, the lease, um, the person who, the entity who leases the land uh, and open space staff. Um, I, I, I won't claim to know much about that, mm -hmm. um, and so let me not get far out of my... Very good call. No, I think it's good. Yep. So I, I guess, um, just tell me, if, uh, there's, there's a pre-existing driveway and it's pre-impacted. Is, is there opportunity to utilize that or is this going in a different place? I'm t oh. It's hard to see from the map. Yeah, so, so um, if you can picture in your mind's eye being along Baseline Road, uh, looking east, um, you, the Howard Ditch crosses under you and then proceeds along the, the northern part of the right-of-way and then heads north through the property. 
Uh, on the left of the ditch, it's wetland, and you can see it's very green. On the right of the ditch, it, the, the property goes up, it's upland, so not wetlands. Uh, a little farther in, there's still some remnants of the old residence that was there. There's an existing driveway. That driveway is, is the, uh, the only way onto the property currently from Baseline Road. Mm -hmm. So we imagine that our contractor will use that driveway. So to your point, that, that uh, existing driveway will be used for construction. So the transportation impacts that would be realized access, accessing into a different part of the property where there's not already an access point, um, uh, what we're proposing is, is sort of the, the impacts are less than that. And that may affect our operational access to the Oliver property, but we can get to it from Burke to, the tenant can get to it from Burke to leases both areas. Um, the second question I had was, you, you showed uh, early in the slides what <coughs> happens when these systems back up. Can you just paint the picture of what the, the mitigation plan is? Should these things overflow, these manholes pop? I just want to understand on a bigger picture. I mean. Um, yeah, it's it's hard to imagine. So the, I think in, in all in Not both of these Not for those projects, of us who had that happen in 2013. <laughs> right, right. We saw so, how it happened. Right. So, <laughs> Um, so many, there are many residents who, who will tell you a story about their own house and how there was a health issue inside of it. Um, <clears throat> there are ways to prevent that from happening, but the reality is that it will always happen if it rains enough. So what we've done is we've identified a level of service that we're going to bring our infrastructure up to. It's pretty ambitious. Um, these projects are part of that. Um, so the, the impacts to people, you can maybe imagine sewage in someone's basement. I think. How your question is more about uh, the environmental impact of a uh, sewer surcharge. So the um, if since you're giving me an opportunity to paint a HUD grim picture, I, I will, and it, it'll be uh, for the interceptor project. Um, when I showed you the the picture that looked like corrugated pipe, that's actually the second rebar cage. So it's already the first rebar cage, and that pipe is already gone. Um, so that pipe is going to fail. Um, when it fails, <laughs> there's gonna be, you know, the, the flow in that pipe on a normal day, average flow is approximately 10 million gallons. And so one day would be 10 million gallons into Boulder Creek of, of raw sewage. Uh, that would have catastrophic impacts, not only on the ecology of Boulder Creek, but downstream users, ditches, uh, the town of Lafayette, you know, South Platte River, so that all the cities that pull off the South Platte, it would be a huge deal. Um, we want to get in front of that, and we're committed to getting in front of that. Um, we're moving through the process. It's, you know, obviously these types of projects take a long time, um, but um, working with open space, it's nice uh, to have done this collaboration before um, the submittal goes back into the county. And so, you know, if we were to select our top alternative without speaking to open space, it probably would have resulted in a conversation later on about a disposal on the poor farm Fort Chambers property that it has very high historic value, um, that it would be very difficult and the process would draw out even longer, right? So what we think we have is an alignment that'll work for everyone as a compromise on both sides, and, but it'll address a really high priority in the system. So hopefully I didn't get too grim there. No, thank you. Okay, sure. Uh, just one question that I think is tied to that. The, the existing interceptor sewer alignment, which is the corrugated picture that you showed, right? What kind of repairs do you have planned to that old part that has to be kept because of the Four Mile Canyon flows? Um, so, so the repair and the re remediation, the rehabilitation of that pipe is going to be mostly trenchless. And so where possible, we're going to install a pipe within a pipe. Okay. So we're going to put a plastic pipe within the concrete pipe. There are a few ways to do that. And I can talk uh, for a long time about <laughs> the pros and cons of each way. Um, but the reality is that all of those techniques involve some surface impacts. And so we've tried to describe those in, um, as much detail as we thought was appropriate without having any final decisions or final design in attachment D that shows that alignment and shows areas where there will be surface disturbance. Surface disturbance might look um, at, you know, best case scenario, it'll be an HDPE, a plastic pipe sitting on the surface that needs to get install, installed to carry the existing flows. Um, worst case, 
we have to pop the top off of a manhole to fit plastic pipe into it um, and excavate, do a long narrow excavation on one end of it so that we can fit this pipe into it. So that's a technique called slip lining. Um, and then uh, cured in place pipe is another um, viable technology and, uh, and so we'll, we'll be weighing uh, weighing the pros and cons of those two techniques, which have slightly different surface impacts. Both have some surface impacts, which will be closely coordinated with open space staff on, on open space property. So those kinds of remediation are planned and will be happening? They are planned. They're very necessary, and they are planned. Okay. I just have one other question, and it has to do with something that you said early on, and my recollection of in the 1900s of combined sewer overflows and all the national efforts around that. You said that we do not have combined sewer overflows, That's but we do have flows into the sewers from outside because of cracks. Do I have that right? You, you have that right. So, so what we, what we describe that as inflow and infiltration. So the cracks, for okay. example, would be infiltration. So after se the September 2013 flood, the day after, in the week after, we had a really big spike of flow. And these flows were coming in from people's basements. They were coming in from manholes that were surcharged. They were coming in from illicit connections to the system. Um, over 2014, 2015, <clears throat> our wastewater flows stayed high. The reason why they stayed high is the water table was high enough right. that we had more infiltration into those cracks in the pipe. Um, uh, one classic site for that infiltration is at the, the point where private taps connect to the public system. And inevitably there's, there's a hole that's cut in our pipe and, and water enters. Even if we line the pipe, we have to reinstate the service mm -hmm. and remediation strategies that address you know, the private side, we haven't gotten to yet. Some communities are tackling that, but that's actually not the city's property, and so it gets complicated. But we're making, um, one of the things we're doing for that um, infiltration um, and the cracks in the pipe thing is that we're, we're spending approximately $3 million per year, and there's a 20-year plan to replace or to line all of the pipes in the system that are not already plastic. Mm -hmm so that um, structurally we'll be in a better place, we'll have less of the inflow, and eventually address some of the infiltration as well. I just want to thank you and all the Open Space and Mountain Park staff that worked on this collaboration because I can tell that it was not an insignificant amount of time and effort, and I really appreciate the work that you've done on this. So thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. okay. Good. Yes. Thanks, Cole, and thanks everyone for you know taking open space considerations into such careful account and designing these two projects. So, Cole, I have one. Uh, what okay. uh, um, tentative uh, question, and that is: so, no storm drains are connected to the sewer system? So those illicit connections that I mentioned, uh, that, that happens sometimes. Um, people with sump pumps, storm drains. In the older parts of town, it's hard to identify. And so it, our, our closed caption TV, um, you know, sometimes we can identify uh, a lateral where some of that's coming in, uh, where it's obviously not waste, wastewater coming in. We can turn a, a property's water off and it still comes in. And so, um, those, those issues are, are really difficult to chase down, but we're making slow progress and uh, correcting issues as, as, we f as we find them. But the main storm drains then drain directly into Boulder that, Creek? Or? That's correct. And, and if you see uh, a storm inlet, often there's a Keep It Clean Partnership logo that says this drains to creek, right? And so those, that's our stormwater system that's separate. Um, there, are, there are some large municipalities in the, in the country, older ones, typically that have combined sewers. Chattanooga um, is dealing with a big issue. Kansas City has uh, a huge issue. Seattle, um, you know, many, many communities that are on, uh, on consent decree from the EPA and who are being made to spend an, in, a crazy amount of money on, on those, uh, those issues. Uh, we're lucky to have had the planning we did, so our systems are mostly separate uh, with this small caveat that we do have some impacts from uh, wet weather events. Thanks. Okay. Thank you.
Thanks so much, Cole. Uh, we're going to uh, continue with our parade of uh, utility staff. We thought uh, uh, as long as you all are here that uh, uh, we would do some repetition. I don't know how many of you tuned in to a presentation made last month, I believe it was to City Council, in which uh, utility staff provided a snapshot of what's going to happen over the next five months in terms of uh, South Boulder Creek, uh, when council will be approached, when boards will be approached, when the community will be approached with some with some new information that will be brought forward and, and in talking with uh, Joe and staff, we thought it might be just good to uh, do a, a very quick synopsis of what was presented last month to you all so we're all under a, uh, a common understanding of, uh, of when you might see these guys again. So with that, uh, thanks Brandon for coming tonight. Sure, yeah, no problem. Um, I'm Brandon Coleman, I'm an engineering project manager with the Stormwater and Flood Utility. Um, I'm managing the Sol South Boulder Creek Flood Mitigation Project. We've I've been here uh, before, so it's nice to see you guys again. Um, I'm here to provide an update on the upcoming process and schedule for the South Boulder Creek Flood Mitigation Project. Like Dan said, having Cole here, it seemed uh, a good time for me to try and get in front of you guys, let you know what's coming down the pipe. Um, I presented in September about some upcoming key milestones related to the project and just want to outline the process um, related to those milestones as we see them coming up. So one of the key milestones that was coming up in Q1 of 2020 was this conceptual design analysis report, and that's really what this process is focused on. Um, yeah, so you can go ahead and flip, flip the slide. So. Uh, We've presented this timeline uh, to council in November, like Dan mentioned. We've also presented a format of this to RAB to kind of run it through before we went to council. Um, I really want to keep you guys in the loop so you know what's coming down the pipe and um, when your input's going to be needed and um, who all is going to be giving input and kind of make sure you guys are aware of the process as we go. So. At the council meeting in July, staff was directed to look at modifications to South Boulder Creek flood mitigation project as part of the conceptual design analysis. Um, so we've been working on that and we're getting ready to present the results of that report. So this is really how we're planning to present those results to council and also to the boards and to the public, uh, just to make sure everybody's really well informed about what we found out from that conceptual analysis report. So. Um, do, do, do. So the results of the analysis, our plan right now is to present those to council in February at a study session on February 25th, and that's that second purple uh, dot up there. And that's really when we'll release all the results, the study session format gives us a good opportunity to uh, talk to council, get their feedback, really get an in-depth dive on the technical details of what we found and what we're looking for. Um, from that point, we would expect to go to to the boards and to the public, so um, that would include the Water Resources Advisory Board, the Planning Board, potentially with any land use changes that we might come up with from the analysis, and then the Open Space Board as well. So that would tentatively be the March meeting for you guys is when we would expect to come here and present those similar results and um, really provide council's feedback and look for your guys' feedback on what we found from the conceptual analysis as well. So the engagement period also includes uh, activities to inform the public and uh, I think we would, we're planning to do some form of open house, we haven't quite mapped that out, but that would happen in this March-April period and the intent would be we want to compile all that information and then bring that back to council in May, so the board's feedback, the public feedback and uh, really get direction on how we're going to proceed with this project from council in May. Um, so this is the same slide they've seen, uh, and that's kind of where we're at. Uh, this is just brief. I just wanted to touch base with you guys to make sure you guys were aware of what was coming. So uh, if you got any questions, I'll do my best to answer them. And yeah, well, thanks for the time tonight. This is a, com a combined question and comment, but um, I just want to make sure that the March presentation to the, this board will include the upstream issue, which is sort of different from, I think, some of the conceptual designs that you're probably talking about, which are probably refinements to variant one and where that's going, because this board um, in our uh, 
feedback to council had expressed uh, considerable interest in uh, a deeper dive on sort of the upstream issues, and I think it would be very helpful for us to hear in a sort of a consolidated presentation. I think there may be some bits and pieces that we've seen and some other pieces that may have gone to council that we may not have seen, but for us to have a consolidated presentation on the state of analysis and thinking on the upstream issues, um, and I'm just speaking for myself, of course, but my suggestion would be that we do that with an eye towards, you know, at the end of that, getting a sense of this board of, is there more that people want to know? And if so, you know, let's be specific about what that is. Are people satisfied that they've heard enough that they have now a, a basis to evaluate the upstream alternatives or there may be other possibilities, but to do it in a way that is sufficiently kind of fulsome that rather than what might seem like a check-in, but really presents the state of your analysis, including for many consultants, um, so that you know we can you know, hopefully decide whether that box has been checked and we can move on, you know, or if it's not checked, we need further analysis that we can tell you what we see as the things that need to be looked into. But um, so I don't know if that was what you were planning to do, but I wanted to make sure at a public proceeding I say that so that there's no misunderstanding about, because I think there's been a lot of interest on, well, where is the board going on the upstream issue? And it's my suggestion that we use the March meeting as a way of fully educating the board and seeing what we can do in the way of coming to some resolution on where we are on that issue. Mm -hmm. right. Tom, if I may, because I've, I've had some direct one-on-one uh, uh, -on -one conversations with Joe Tadeucci, uh, the director now, not the interim director, uh, of utilities in, in regards to that. And so uh, there, uh, uh, and, and correct me if I'm wrong from utility staff perspective, but in March, um, I believe utility staff will certainly be offering their opinion on, on the upstream solution in regards to uh, any solutions that they've looked at that could eliminate the need for the uh, 36 flood wall, and, uh, and, um, which is part of the feedback. But my understanding as well is that currently there isn't any new uh, money uh, or time that's being spent at the consultant level to do further investigations of an upstream. Right now, the council has uh, pretty much uh, limited the direction to the staff in terms of what to spend time and money on, and that is within the variant one option. And so that's all the work that's been going on. So uh, when staff, when utility staff would come back to us in March, uh, uh, they, they uh, would be able to provide a synopsis and, uh, and putting all that together of work that's already been done in terms of upstream, but you're uh, unlikely to see any new work uh, that might be coming out of the consultant as within the upstream because really the staff has not had council direction to go and look at that. And I don't know if I'm summarizing that in the right way, but I think that's my understanding and, and having conversations with Joe. So certainly we can have a conversation. Staff, I think, would be willing to offer their professional opinion about they've looked at upstream before, here's everything we've looked at, here's our final conclusion of whether we think that 36 flood wall can come down or not, but I don't think you're, they're going to come with new information, right. a new study. And, it's, and I appreciate it's helpful, I think, for all of us to hear that clarification so that expectations are aligned with what's actually going on. Right. I, uh, maybe this was clear, but just in case it wasn't, um, there's great, even if there's no new analysis, I think this board needs to hear in a sort of consolidated way what, ha what analyses have been done and, you know, what were the basis for the various conclusions that you all reached. And mm -hmm. so that at least we have a complete uh, understanding of the current state of play on that. Um, I guess one question is, if nothing new is being done, does it still make sense to wait until March? Or are we better off, if there, in other words, if the presentation isn't going to change from, you know, tomorrow through March, because it's all material that's already been pulled together. Um, and I throw that out. Um, I just, what I, you know, to be completely transparent about this, what I want to avoid as a situation where after the presentation, one or many members of this board say, gee, 
we need a deeper dive on the following aspect of the upstream. And others say, well, knowing that, we kind of wish we hadn't lost the last two or three months. We would have been perhaps working on that. Or maybe it goes to council if you feel you need authorization to dive into whatever it is. It's getting a little hypothetical here, but that's what I want to avoid is, are we going to endanger sort of losing several months only to then say, oh, gee, um, maybe there's more to be looked at here. That's, but if you all feel that March is the right time, I won't push it too hard, but I don't yeah, want to. I would just say that in March, we want to put it all in context. So if that's something you guys um, specifically would like to see in March, I think it's important that we have it in context with the analysis we're doing now as well. And that's kind of the point of waiting for February, because there's obviously a couple new council members as well, so we're going to have to review kind of the history of this project. So that's what we're working on now is compiling that history with the new analysis so you get the full picture, and that's what we would bring back. Okay. And because one of the things we had asked for was, I, I think in, this was Karen's motion, was a, I think she called it a side-by-side, -side, but the basic idea was a, ju a direct juxtaposition of here's what an upstream alternative would look like with respect to identified criteria or metrics, and here's what variant one would look like with respect to those same metrics. So you can sort of do a, a direct comparison. Um, so if it's just given the state of development of variant one, if the, the right time to do that is March, that's fine. Um, if it's, you know, if you already know the answers on the upstream side, uh, maybe sooner is better. But um, it is, you're right that we do want to, we don't want to just look at upstream in isolation, but rather in a juxtaposing it against variant one. Mm -hmm. I have one uh, comment on that. I unfortunately uh, missed the extended meeting on the topic, um, but did want to be clear for me. Uh, I um, More information on upstream is wonderful. I personally am really focused on uh, more detail on what the exact wetland mitigation proposal looks like, who's going to pay for it, what the cost estimates are, um, and what the trade-offs uh, related to this flood wall in terms of wetlands uh, really actually look like because in my experience it wouldn't be the first time that wetlands were lost and then forgotten to be replaced. Right. And and we uh, also heard from council about getting meeting with permitting agencies up front and trying to get their input as soon as possible. And uh, the Army Corps, which regulates wetlands from the federal level, is one of those agencies. And also the city has a very uh, strict wetland ordinance as well that we would have to meet those requirements. So I think there's some, hopefully there's some comfort in that there are federal regulations that we would have to meet and um, there are penalties if you don't meet those requirements. Yeah, I, I think for my own comfort level, just having a, a succinct presentation of that at that time is gonna be very helpful. Okay. And Brandon, I, I want to, uh, I, I think, reiterate what Tom said. Uh, I'm a little concerned. It, it strikes me that uh, there may be a little confusion or uncertainty about the board, this board's role in, in the whole decision-making process. Mm -hmm. And I, I would agree wholeheartedly with Tom's recommendation that it, the sooner we can kind of get that conversation out there, um, as far as this board is concerned, the better, because I, I, I'm just a little reluctant to think that in, in March, you know, if, if there are some concerns that this board has that, you know, once again, we're kind of uh, getting late in, in the process, and um, the sooner the better if, right. if we can do that. Yeah, and I do want to just let you guys know, I'm sure you're probably aware, but that feedback you guys generated in September, we did provide to council as well in an information package uh, on October 1st, just so you guys know they do have that information. Yeah, and, but yeah, I think we want to- That was before the election or after the election? Um, before. It was before. Before, yes. <laughs> so. We do want to reiterate the board's prerogative, though, on the sure. open space <laughs> issues and that, that there was a recommendation from this board uh, to council based on its request so that um, it's not like we're, this board is out there, um, you know, on, on its own. Council asked us for, um, you know, some feedback. Right. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. And I believe more feedback will be generated in March, and if this board wants to repeat, or and I imagine that feedback will be compiled with past feedback to provide to council again. So in May, there, you know, you all may have more direct questions or feedback or recommendations, depending on what form you're looking for right. uh, to council in May. But uh, from a, just sitting at, in a staff capacity level, you know, with, with without, you know, council has provided parameters to where to, where to spend the money and resources right now for for the utility staff. So again, you know, I, I want to be transparent about the fact that that money is and that resources is being spent on variant one analysis right now because there's a timeline associated with that and understanding what you're saying, Tom and Dave and Karen about wanting you know to have that conversation about upstream but uh, i also just want to temper expectations that there isn't going to be you know that new analysis that you all may uh, want to see or, or looking to see and certainly if that wants to, if you want to reiterate that um recommendation to to council again for them to uh, discuss and consider in May, that would be another opportunity okay. to do that. And I appreciate the clear, I appreciate yeah. what you're saying, and so to you can follow along that line and maybe sort of cut to the chase a bit here, I mean, does staff feel that its existing analysis and information on the upstream alternatives is sufficient to answer the, the, the sort of the question or the, mm -hmm. the, the way we framed the issue in our motion? Because obviously, if the answer to that question, the answer to the question I just posed is no, then we do need to sort of have a discussion. Because then we're, I don't want to engage in a, a fruitless exercise if we already know that what we hear in March is going to be insufficient. Then we ought to do something so that uh, we're not faced with that situation three months from now. If your feeling is, oh yeah, you have enough to do the analysis to, uh, to answer the question the way we framed the issue, okay, that's, that's different. But I, will, I do sort of want to directly pose that question so there's no kind of misunderstanding about what we'll be seeing in March. Right, and I think the concepts that have been evaluated to date, we could do that analysis, but with the new concepts that we're working on now, I think it's really important you see those side by side to the new concepts as well because that's kind of the direction we've gone down so um, rather than looking at it in the past I think we should really look at it with all the options on the table as we understand them um, and that would be in February when we really have that clear understanding and, and Tom if I'm hearing you right why don't John and I and Don get together with with uh, Joe and, and Brandon and staff and see you know if you're prepared to deliver more information on that question prior to March, I think that's what you're asking. If if yeah if yeah if and they already sort of know and they just need to put together an, uh, that opinion, can we do that sooner than March? And or, I think that's your question. And the flip side would be if you look again at what uh, the statement was from this board and conclude, gee, we really haven't looked at the upstream alternatives in sufficient depth to answer some of those questions. Mm -hmm. We ought to then have that, I don't know, have that discussion about, well, okay, what are we doing then? Uh, is that mean we need to make a statement to council that we would request additional funds be authorized so that you could be in a position to answer our question? Or mm -hmm. there may be other alternatives, but I don't want to just wait till March to learn that, oh, we really don't know the answers to the questions that the board posed because we haven't been looking at that. If that's the situation, then let's tackle it now and figure out the path ahead so we're all... Yeah. Oh, I'm no, sorry. I, I, <laughs> I, agree I agree with you, Tom. And I, the, I, I feel like I need to ask for some clarification on language that's being used. Sure. I heard you say the Highway 36 flood wall, and I think it's not in the CDOT right-of-way anymore. It's an open space and mountain right. parks flood wall yep. at this point. We're on the we same page on that. Yep. But. Um, and, and the kinds of information that the Open Space Board of Trustees was requesting was information that we felt we needed to be able to make any of the decisions that council is asking us, or recommendations that council is asking us to make. And if we don't get that information, then we're gonna be at a point a few more months down the line 
and we're going to throw up our hands and say we can't answer that because the information we asked for in September still hasn't been provided. So I think the request of getting that information sooner rather than later is very important. I was expecting a little bit more than this schedule tonight. I was expecting some of the answers to the September questions. So mm. I'm totally in agreement with Tom that OS, my personal opinion is that OSBT keeps getting squeezed. And that started happening in June, July, when City Council said, oh, problem with CDOT. It's okay, we'll build the whole thing on open space lands, except for what we can negotiate to put back on CDOT land. Um, and that requires a whole set of decisions on the part of OSBT that we cannot answer, in my opinion, until we have answers to multiple questions about underground flow and how that's going to be sustained about the upstream options and what, and my understanding was that there would be an analysis by staff, not by consultant, of upstream options and that that would come back to us. Um, and so uh, my question is, what happens between this schedule presentation and when you're coming back to us in March, expecting us to, to have some substantive discussions, opinions, decisions, recommendations, when we still don't have any information? So if I may. <laughs> sure, Dan. Um, yeah. So where we take out the last year, where we thought we would come to you next would be as we started to get towards a 30% design of, right. of the variant. We're not there yet. I believe what utility staff is going to be asking in May is, do we, can we proceed with getting to that 30% design? And that's when we'll start to know more specifically about the, re the, the very specific issues of impacts that you all will need then to weigh in on the use of open space lands for this project. Because my understanding is in conversation with this board a year ago was it would be hard for you to rule specifically if it became a disposal process or a recommendation process whatever that process is, that it would be hard for you to do specifics without knowing the specific impacts. And the project, for whatever reasons over the past year, is not getting to that 30% when we would have that type of details for you. So my understanding is, is what we want to get to in May is that green light to go and proceed to that 30%. Am I and yeah. At which time we're going to then start to generate more of the specific information on Exactly how long does that flood wall need to be? Exactly how much space of open space do we actually need to utilize? Right. And those other questions that are going to be central in deliberations with this board. Because right now we're still looking at variants within variant one, and that's kind of where we're at. Yeah. Yeah. But I feel like I have to say again yeah. the whole concept was changed in June from a flood wall in the CDOT right away to, oops, that's not possible, so we're going to put the flood wall in open space in Mountain Parks land. That to me was a significant change that is, is being eclipsed by all these other plans and timelines and, and, and perhaps ignored. And I would agree. I, I think that with that change, one of the concerns I have is, you know, whether a flood wall is necessary at all, given the potential for um, other options. And that's where the upstream, um, you know, options analysis becomes critically important. And I think before this board can make a determination both on the wall and where, you know, on the wall's location, we should feel confident that, you know, that's the best, if not the only alternative that makes sense. And quite frankly, I'm not 
there at this point. I, I would agree, and, and part of the analysis we're working on is from that CDOT information. So that, that's why it's important we take the new design and see what the CDOT impacts are as well. In Can you say a little bit more about what you mean when you say the CDOT information? So moving the wall out of the right of way. So there's some okay. environmental the lack impacts. Of CDOT. Yes, there's involved. environmental impacts we're gonna we need we're including in this analysis that we're working on right now, and I think it's important for you guys to see those numbers in comparison to what we've done with the upstream option to be able to really weigh um, how much further you would like to go. So I think that's that's why I think March is a really good time because you need the analysis we're doing now because it's still just a conceptual analysis, and that's the same we've done uh, to date. So. Okay, so any other questions or comments? Okay, well, oh, go ahead. Yeah, just, just briefly, I, I think um, I support uh, my co-trustees' requests for additional information. I do want to be careful of playing the game of asking for more information forever. I do think there's a, a more interesting conversation on the other side of this, which is um, a pretty clear view on the impacts being requested. And I think it's gonna require a really deep look into the community's values about uh, the lives of living beings, uh, y you know, uh, both uh, animal and human. And I just wanna reiterate for myself that the it doesn't become productive until a description of the mitigation that is sufficient to cover for the kinds of damages being contemplated has really been sp spelled out. Sure. So um, that's that's a really key part for me. There's a lot of ask here, I feel like, of this board, but there isn't much detail about uh, what, what is being planned in terms of mitigation. Yeah, and in our statement to council that one of the four preconditions, we identified four preconditions that we felt had to be addressed before we would even consider a disposal, never mind how we'd actually vote on the disposal, but before we felt the disposal question was even ripe for decision. And one of them is exactly that, that, you know, a fully formed mitigation plan um, would be, you know, presented to us. Um, you know, that's probably a little bit down the road, but I think I agree with how the sooner we start to get a sense of what that is, you know, the more effective our feedback to council can be on whether, you know, the, the mitigation plan seems to be on the right track or isn't on the right track. So I, I think <clears throat> there's an understanding that you all will get together to reflect on the, the concern that we're raising um, and how we're using the next three months um, and, you know, whether some course correction is appropriate here so that you know, there's no misunderstanding about what um, what we'll be seeing in March. Yeah, I think the goal is to make the March meeting as productive as we can, and if there's some things we can get out to you sooner, that's the type of discussions we'll have. Yep. And and I would suggest in the interim making it clear to council that because we have so many questions and we have a role in making recommendations to council on both the project and dispose, potential disposal of OSMP land, that that's a time chunk that needs to be attended to, that it can't just be glossed over. There needs to be significant time to both, for us to both get information and ask questions and understand enough to be able to make a reasonable decision. And that that's not an insignificant <coughs> chunk of time in my mind. Mm -hmm. Sure. Could I ask a question? Uh, Brandon yeah. or Douglas? Sure. Or, sure. Um, yeah. <laughs> so in May, if you get the green light to move with some form of variant one, what's the time frame again? I think you probably gave it to us in September, the time frame of when we would expect to be around the 30% when we would start to get a lot more details yeah. of this project that would know what the impacts are. Right, and the presentation in September, I think we, we probably have at least a year's worth of design after that point, but the idea would be that we're coming back to this board at some of those key milestones, mitigation yep. plan, groundwater, all those things as we're proceeding to that 30% design for whatever the configuration is and really getting your input as we're going along to make sure we're down the right track so when you guys actually get to that point, you've been involved in the process. And that's part of the reason for me coming tonight. I know it's not um, 
very a lot of information on the technical side, but I think our next presentation will be very technical, and um, I just want to prepare you guys for what we're working on and what the process is looking like for the city and just engagement for everybody, including you guys as well. So. Okay. And I appreciate it, too. I appreciate the time. Uh, right, and just, you, you probably know this, but March 11th is also the night that we're uh, tackling prairie dogs. So, okay. someone has <laughs> I have it tentatively <laughs> on Schedule here, so problem. I think we'll work with your staff on One of, one of those issues right goes day. first, and one of them goes second, sure, and sure. someone will be yeah. here for a long I, evening. I think we're, we have <laughs> And we there, certainly so will. <laughs> we'll work with we'll you guys on most. when's the best time to bring that um, forward to you guys as well. So. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks Great. a lot. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thanks, Brandon. Thanks, Cole. Thanks, Douglas, for coming tonight. I appreciate your time. Oh. No, you're welcome. Okay. Um, before we introduce the next subject, I just got a, I just want to introduce a, a couple of formal, uh, informal matters that I wanted to do with make sure somebody in particular was in the room uh, at the time. But uh, I just want to uh, make reference to a milestone uh, that uh, most of you are aware of, but it was exactly 30 years ago tonight that a young ranger named Mark Gershman made his first appearance and first, uh, his voice was first aired in front of the OSBT, and it was, I believe, this exact date 30 years ago. And so, actually, I actually think were we, well, were maybe we, it was December 9th or something like were that. Were we videotaping sessions? <laughs> I don't think we were videotaping it. Um, but so I wanted to use that, that milestone as a chance just to tell the full board and also any community members that uh, may be watching that uh, at the end of this year, Mark will be formally retiring from the department. Uh, luckily, uh, after a little bit of hiatus, uh, uh, he will be coming back in a part-time capacity uh, for, uh, for a little bit of time to help wrap up some projects and to work on some lifts that we're doing. But all intents and purposes, uh, his uh, last uh, uh, formal full-time day with us is going to be the end of December. So I just wanted to recognize the milestone and just wanted to uh, make a few comments about Mark. Um, it, you know, you spend enough time here uh, in the city or in, 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 in the department and you're naturally going to carry a lot of different titles along with you. And a few of them that, uh, uh, that I have written down here is Ranger Naturalist, a Wetland Ecologist, Resource Conservation Supervisor, Monitoring Workgroup Supervisor, Environmental Planner, lead planner and supervising the uh, planning and design uh, work group. So I don't know how you didn't get more uh, different titles in there in your, in your tenure, but uh, that, that's pretty impressive. And uh, Mark actually contributed to a number of our, uh, and led or contributed to a number of plans, including our visitor master plan, who I believe Dave is very familiar with, and our grassland ecosystem plan, our forest ecosystem plan, some study area trail plans. So his fingerprints are all over the department, and I just wanted to make sure that I uh, uh, paid homage to Mark's service uh, with the department and to acknowledge his 30 years ago tonight, you might have been sitting in that same exact chair. So uh, <laughs> hats off to you and, and thanks so much for your service to the department. Um, uh, one other, a uh, uh, couple more informal before I bring up uh, um, uh, our next subject, but on December 17th, the reminder that council is going to be considering the Shanahan Ranch acquisition project, so if anyone wants to be in attendance to that, uh, there'll be a, about a 15 minute presentation from Luke, and we're expecting about a half hour of questions and responses from council. On December 17th, we will be the first public hearing item on the agenda. Um, so, uh, and I also just wanted to make uh, an announcement, uh, although I'm sure people have figured out if they're watching that, uh, 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 that the uh, recommendations uh, for the Gephardt uh, integrated site plan is on for the January calendar. Uh, previous iterations of our projected uh, schedule w would have called for it to be tonight. Staff needed more time to refine uh, 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 the recommendation that they're going to be bringing forward. So 
so that will be in front of you at the uh, January 8th, and that will be a public hearing and an opportunity for any community members who want to uh, chime in and voice their opinion uh, on our recommendation or the project as a whole, January 8th will be that time. So with that, we'll move on to item number C, which is our master plan kickoff community event, and Allison Eklund, our community relations coordinator, will give us a short presentation on that. Hi, this will be short and sweet. I want to give you an update that the master plan rollout and appreciation event will be in the end of February now. You may have seen in your packet calendar a January 27th date. We have a lot more planning and preparation to do, so it will be later on in February. And the goal of having this event is really to take the time to think all of the community for participating in the 18 month long process with us and giving us a lot of great input. As you've probably heard the stats, we received over 10,000 comments. We held seven well attended community meetings, two drop in listening sessions and received 1300 responses to the statistically valid survey. So what that says is that we really couldn't have done it without the community. So we want to take the time to thank them, keep the excitement and the momentum building with the plan, and we'll also be able to present that night uh, the final version of the plan. So we'll get it out of a Word document and have a final, final plan there that night. So that will be exciting. We'll also have a graphic scriber attend, and we'll cover a wall, and she'll be drawing what she hears from the community that night. So in the end, we'll have a really great visual, and uh, we'll have Hi. So <laughs> we'll make sure to post the date once we have it final. Um, but we'll see you all there. Okay. All right. Good. Questions? Yeah. Okay. Thanks, Allison. Thanks. All right, moving on to uh, item number D. Uh, we're going to invite our science officer, uh, Brian Anneker, up here. And I thought I would just take the opportunity to say a few words about Brian, since he probably wouldn't say it himself. But typically, when we're introducing new uh, pro program areas to initiatives, uh, we always ask the staff to introduce themselves, tell them a little, a little bit about their background. We did it with the trail staff. And so I just want to say this is a former alumni of my college, University University of Wisconsin grad right here, graduated from the University of Wisconsin. Um, he's got about 20 years of experience working in six different states, and I believe it, uh, uh, California and Colorado and Arkansas and Pennsylvania and Wisconsin are all part of the states uh, that uh, uh, that uh, you have your uh, fingers in. He's got a bachelor's degree in botany and conservation biology from UW. He's got a PhD in ecology from the University of California, Davis, and he's got postdoc experience working with the California Department of Fish and Wildlife. So we're really th uh, honored that uh, he's uh, serving in the capacity uh, as the uh, science officer. And in that capacity, he really supports all of o OSP, OSMP and, uh, and, and the work we do in terms of inventorying and monitoring and research projects and data analysis and making our da data available to the community and to the public and uh, promote scientific collaboration throughout the department and is our data liaison in some aspects to other departments within within the city. So with that, uh, I will let Brian uh, tell you a little bit about what he wants to present to you tonight. Thanks, Dan. Hi, everybody. I can get this to work. Oh, turn turn it, it on. Good. Okay. So these are the three points outlined for my talk tonight. Um, during that 18 month master plan process, we heard loud and clear from the community, uh, we'd like more data, we'd like to know about the trends, we'd like to understand how you use data to um, make decisions. And I think we did a really great job of daylighting a bunch of new information as part of our system overview report through our community workshops and in the master plan document itself. But as part of the master plan, we made commitments to both refine and accelerate our scientific approach to conservation and recreation, which I think are best illustrated in our two learning laboratory strategies. So I'll describe what those are tonight and 
um, but also in an outcome that we had in the master plan around shared informed stewardship. So tonight I'll review those strategies, spend most of my time on that learning laboratory part, give you a couple of examples of where we've used data to inform decisions in the past, and then have some comments about how we can get even better at the way we collect data and how we use that data in doing so in a cost-effective manner. So these are the two strategies I alluded to in the master plan. Ecosystem Health and Resilience 7 was develop a learning laboratory approach to conservation and 9 was a learning laboratory approach to recreation. So what I'd like to do tonight is imagine our learning laboratory as a physical building that has three rooms in it and that's surrounded by the open space land system. And I'll then give you a tour of those three rooms. The first of three is our inventory room and an inventory is simply a complete listing of items from the system overview report. Here's an example, table 5.1, which is species diversity by group. The groups there are plants, mammals, birds, butterflies, reptiles, amphibians, and fish. And we know the system well enough to put some estimates down on how many of each of those we have. So for example, for plants, in total over a thousand different unique plant species. And then further, we estimate that 741 of those are native and 275 of those are non-native. And of course, our efforts at inventory go above and beyond that. We have pretty detailed understanding of our cultural resources. We're starting to look below ground to think about what we have in terms of soil carbon, for example. We've got a really good idea of the structure of our forests, which species there are, what the composition of those forests are. A new initiative is to start to think about where our scenic views are and what those scenic views are worth in terms of a resource. And detailed understanding of the infrastructure we have on the system for visitor use and getting better at putting all this kind of inventory information into an asset management system where we can track and understand the condition of these assets. The second room then in our learning laboratory is our monitoring room. Monitoring is assessing the condition of the resources on open space and thinking about how that condition changes over time. One of the best examples of this is from our grassland plan, which we alluded to earlier, which we call GMAP, which was published in 2010. And thanks to uh, Mark's work, it has over 50 different indicators proposed that we could measure to understand the health of the grassland system. So I'm just gonna give you an example for one of those indicators and how we measure it over time. So as you know, one of our conservation targets in the grassland context is Xeric tallgrass prairie. This is one of our most special grassland types as some of the highest level of species diversity and the unique combination of species in these communities. And the indicator I wanna highlight is in fact, the number of native plant species per 100 meter square area. 100 meter square is our 50 meter long transect with two meters width to make 100 meters total. And you'll see that here on the y-axis ranging from zero to 50. And then I'm gonna show you the data as we've measured it starting in 2010 with the uh, adoption of this plan through to 2017. Are we ready? <laughs> here comes some numbers. Okay. So in 2010, the average species richness in the Sierra Tallgrass Prairie was 39.8 species. And in 2011, that went up to 45.4, and you can read the rest of the numbers as we go through to 2017. And I've colored the bars according to their condition class. So in the grassland plan, we said, here's an indicator we'd like to measure, and here's some numerical thresholds that will tell us if we're doing a poor job in terms of the health, a fair job, a good job, or a very good job. And so according to those thresholds, the condition of this community with regards to this one indicator is good, it's green, and it's green in each and every year. 
And why I like this example is because when we saw this, we thought, wow, that's remarkable stability overall in terms of change over time in this grassland system. We're not seeing major increases in species diversity or major reductions in species diversity. So that's some level of confidence that we're managing in a way where the climate's not changing rapidly enough to make um, species diversity change dramatically in short order. And also like this example, because when we saw this result, we, we said to ourselves, is this the most cost-effective way to learn about this resource going out year after year and measuring it, or can we reduce the frequency of measurement to something a little um, more cost-effective? And indeed, we decided to reduce our frequency from an annual basis you see here to every third year. So that's our monitoring room, and then our third room is our research room. So research is a systematic investigation of something to establish facts and reach new conclusions. It's different than monitoring in the sense that it's not repeated typically over time. It's more of a discrete project and that it's often hypothesis-based. So you have a prediction that you go out and test on the land. An example I'm gonna use here is tall oak grass, which is a non-native short-lived perennial grass that's invading on open space land, especially just below the NCAR site, but um, pretty extensive beyond that site. Um, in that area, we fenced off a 72-acre enclosure, and on the left side of this fence line in the photograph, you can see tall oak grass, which is that blonde-colored species um, where we haven't done grazing, and then on the right side is inside that 72-acre enclosure where we've grazed repeatedly in the spring with cattle. So that prescriptive grazing approach then has reduced the cover of tall oak grass dramatically and increased the cover of our more preferred species, like the one you see here in purple, which is the late-season big blue stem, which is a, a preferred native grass in this um, conservation target. So you can see it's sort of significant by inspection, which is a great Mark Gershman quote, thank you for that, Mark, um, that it seems to be working. But this is a very cherry-picked photograph, and we've got a bunch of replicated samples inside the 72-acre enclosure that show you some of the contingency where it depends on where you look in terms of where the cattle went and spent the most time and some different elements of landscape topography, water holding capacity and soils. So we're happy to have the data collected to get a sense of that variation on the landscape scale. And sticking with tall oak grass, I've just put three bullets there that illustrate other research questions we've approached and how we've used the assets in our community to help us answer them. So we have a project working with a consultant in the community to look at some different herbicides and herbicide application rates for controlling tall oak grass. We've given a grant to a professor at CU Boulder to look at plant soil feedback. And this is the notion that tall oak grass upon invasion starts to um, condition its soils in ways that further its own growth and deters the growth of native species. And we've worked with the CU Boulder Restoration Ecology class to think about what happens to all the seeds that get produced above ground by tall oak grass once they hit the soil surface. Do they get incorporated into the soil and provide a reservoir of seed? Therefore, if we mow down all the tall oak grass every year, it's just gonna come back year after year, or is seed relatively rare in the seed bank, and so we should feel confident that what we see above ground, um, there won't be a legacy of tall oak grass continuing to come back. And spoiler alert, there isn't a real strong seed bank for tall oak grass. Mm. So that's encouraging. Be so, before you yep. leave that, can I just clarify something that you said in this yep. second bullet? Yes. Did you say that um, there's something that happens in the soil that deters the growth of native species? Yeah, typically the way this would work is through nitrogen or carbon or the ratio of the two. It's very common for a non-native species to alter that ratio in a way that favors its own growth, either by enhancing nitrogen or oh, depleting it. By and effects from the non-natives. Yeah, exactly. Okay, it, thank its you. own feedback in the soil makes the soil better for itself, but worse for natives that aren't adapted I misunderstood for that. what you said. Thank you. Yep. 
So that's kind of a tour of our lab, but are we any good in terms of this learning laboratory approach? So the, to answer that question, I'm just gonna show you some of our accomplishments in 2019 that I think point to the answer to that question of being yes, we're pretty good at it. So our own staff conduct about 40 research and monitoring projects in a year like 2019, and that's spread across over 20 different staff in the department that have scientific training. Working with the community, we have two major citizen science projects. Uh, one is the Raptor Monitoring Program and the other is the BAT Monitoring Program. We have a funded research program that offers small grants every year. In 2019, we offered 10 of those grants to um, those typically go to professors and graduate students. In addition to that, we permitted 40 different unfunded research permits to allow people to do their research on open space land without funding. We partnered closely with Boulder County Parks and Open Space and Jefferson County Open Space, in addition to other agencies. We produced four peer-reviewed publications and scientific journals, two of those with our own staff as co-authors and two from grant recipients. We published two technical reports. You saw the Undesignated Trails report last month, which included an innovative story map, which allowed you to uh, read the story, but also start to interact with the data in the same place. So it's kind of a nice explanation, exploration combination. The Master Plan Statistical Survey, of course. Um, along with that, we published all that data to the City of Boulder Open Data Catalog for anyone to download and to analyze for themselves. And moreover, we even put a document there that showed our work so that somebody could take that raw data and repeat our analysis step by step to derive the exact results we had in the report. And then once they have that, they can start to change some of the choices that we made if they, cho if they so chose to do that. And we are involved in four conferences. The funded research, or the Front Range Open Space Research Symposium was um, in spring of this year, hosted by Jefferson County. The Colorado Open Space Alliance Symposium was in Steamboat. We staff from Open Space helped to organize that and a lot of our staff presented there. We helped to organize and also presented at the Boulder County Nature Association Eco Symposium in spring. And next week, Thursday, we hope to co-organize and we'll be presenting at the Soil Revolution Conference. And last time I checked, there was about two um, registration slots left. So if you're interested in attending and haven't registered, um, you might be able to sneak in. Oops. So here's the 20 plus staff. Um, some of you have been following open space issues for a long time, might recognize almost all of these names. Some of you are new. These might be new names and you'll get to know us over time. I put the list up just to show the bench strength that we have in terms of the number of staff we have with training, but also the diversity of training. You have the, the gotta have plant ecology positions, wildlife ecology, wetland ecology, riparian ecology, but we have some of these other positions that are more um, um, innovative and bleeding edge of where science is going. I think my own position in terms of Integrating data science is one of those. Uh, we've got somebody really focused on study design, trails research, human dimensions research, recreation ecology. Okay, so how do we use that information to make real decisions? Can we give a couple of examples where we think we've done a decent job of that? First one I wanna mention is the use of our public surveys to guide the development of new programs. Visitor Master Plan was preempted with a resident survey in 2004, 512 responses from City of Boulder registered voters asked a question about how appropriate would it be to require dogs to be on leash in the first 100 yards of trailheads. 62% of respondents said very appropriate and 24% said somewhat appropriate. So combined, we take that as strong support for the development of our trailhead leash program, which is um, in place today. Another one a little more complicated is the use of vegetation monitoring to guide where we relocate prairie dogs to. 
The example here is the South Strand property, which is south of Marshall Lake in the southern part of the system. Vegetation monitoring conducted in that same transect style in 2017. And we measured several indicators. I'll show you three here. First one is native species richness, the same thing we talked about earlier, the number of native plants per unit area. The criteria we would have to make this site suitable for long-term sustainability of prairie dogs is we'd like to see at least 18 native species there. We measured an average of 28.4. The interpretation then is this site passes the indicator and would be suitable. Bare ground, we want to see no more than 22% cover of bare ground in that same transect. We observe 1.7%. Interpretation is we pass the criteria. And then perennial grass cover is a greater than or equal to 60%. The observation was lower than that at 41.1, and the inter interpretation is a fail. And so the recommendation then is that this site would not be suitable for relocation at that time. Although we noted during the data collection phase that that site had been recently grazed and in fact was actively being grazed during measurement. And when you go to measure vegetative cover and the site has been grazed recently, you're gonna get an underestimation of plant cover because the plants are gonna grow back um, and the cover would be higher the next time you look at it. And in fact, <coughs> through further reconnaissance and vegetation mapping in subsequent years, the um, decision was made that the cover was sufficient to um, make the site suitable for relocation and the permit was sought in 2019 and granted um, from the state. And uh, later th in 2019, over 500 prairie dogs were relocated to the South Strand and adjacent sites from agricultural sites further to the north. So it shows how data is one source of information into decision making and how that information can change over time. Um, but we use it as a guidepost to making recommendations. Here's seven other examples. I won't bother reading to you. If you have questions on these, we can flip back to them and talk, talk through them. Okay, so the third thing I wanna talk about is this idea of moving towards getting shared informed stewardship. So we work hand in hand with the community to get even better at our approach to data collection and connecting that data to decisions. So I think one role for the community and council and the board is to continue to support and promote um, some activities that lead to shared informed stewardship. We have open houses like our trails open house and a restoration open house, great opportunities for us to show you information and put it in the context of our management choices. Field trips, a great chance to get out on the land and see what it looks like, boots on the ground continue to bring you updates like this one going forward. The grassland plan and the forest plan are expected to see updates over the next 10 years. Those will be built on a foundation of data and information that we've collected since those plans uh, were originally put into place. The symposium, which I'm showing the flyer from 2019, will be bringing back again in 2021. The City of Boulder Open Data Catalog is a great resource that's growing all the time, a chance to access our data and make your own interpretations. We'll continue to look for more citizen science projects. I think with master plan implementation, we'll have a lot of opportunity there. We're looking for ways to make reports more interactive as opposed to static and hard copy. So look for more story maps and uh, you may have seen the Visitation Data Explorer. So chances like that to start to interact with the data and see it at whatever scale is relevant to you. And if you like the old fashioned eight and a half by 11, 100 page PDFs, we have over 400 of those. Thanks in part to Dave's work, um, available at this web link. And I'll, I'll mention in a minute, some uh, approach we're gonna have to add some value to those too. Second area I think we can work on is to start to think about the cost of this work because it doesn't come for free. So any new ask that our own staff have or we get from the board or the council or community comes with a cost. We have to think about how we budget for that or some sort of trade off we're gonna make in terms of the portfolio of the research and science that we do. Can we add one more project or do we have to stop one of them? Or do we have to trade off something around project implementation or service delivery? 
And because these are not free projects, we might also start thinking about ways to reduce costs. One way is to use older and non-local data. I think as we approach a decision, we want data collected this year on that site, but sometimes data that's two or more years old or collected on adjacent sites can get us close enough to understanding the problem and the environment to making a decision without having a new cost to collect data, um, a fresh data set. Related to that is let's pay attention to the literature. A lot of other people are studying the same um, problems that we have, and if we can use and, and make inferences based on published papers, um, we can prevent having to make new expense expenditures. Continue to work with Jefferson and Boulder County's organizations. It's remarkable how similar our problems are and how duplicative a lot of our research is in, in particular, so keeping those conversations going and learning from each other I think is a major cost savings. There's benefits in informal questionnaires. You can kind of get to most of the way of understanding where the community is at on a subject, and that's much cheaper than doing the full-blown statistically valid survey. And then once we've done the work to collect the data, use the data, I think there's often uh, the case where we get to the finish line and the data says one thing, but we end up in a political landscape that we didn't anticipate or uh, there's special interest there wherein we don't listen to what the data is trying to tell us. So if we've done the work, let's add value to it by using it to make decisions um, when that's appropriate. Or if we're starting off a new decision-making process and we know the stakes are really high and that the, there's a lot of um, values at, in play, maybe the most more cost-effective thing to do is not go about an expensive data collection process in the first place. So looking internally, what are some things we're doing to improve our approach? Um, the main thing I want to highlight is in 2019, we formed a cross-functional team, we're calling the science team, which includes 10 different staff members from eight different work groups, all levels of our organization. We set out two goals. One is an internal facing goal of developing policies, procedures, and best practices in these three domains, which I'm showing on the right side of the slide. Data collection and study design, everyone's favorite statistics, and data visualization, and our approach to reporting. And then looking externally, our main focus is on strengthening our approach to communicating our science to the community. I think the work we do has a lot of value, but maybe we're not the best at storytelling and showing the value to the community. And an example of that, in 2020, we plan to launch a science at OSMP webpage, which might look something like this. It would have um, kind of a tour of the learning lab, like I've talked about here tonight. Of course, it will have science resources, which will just link out to things like our grants program, our permits program, our dashboards, story maps, open data catalog, announcements for when we have new publications. So it's kind of a one-stop shop to learn about all those different sources of information. We'll have profiles of the science staff, so those 20 plus names I flashed on the screen, a little bit more about who they are and what they do. And then some new things we're gonna add is that research report library I mentioned with the 400 studies. Try to make that a little more searchable, a little more user-friendly, some ways to highlight some of those studies, even though they might have a little bit of shine to them, they're still relevant. And another development area is a web video series where we'll do two or three minute video shorts where we'll interview staff, potentially in the field, collecting data, and they can tell their story about why they're collecting data, how that data is gonna get used to feed into decisions. So we'll make sure you uh, get notified once that web page launch, launches. So in summary, I gave you a tour of our three rooms of our learning laboratory, give you a couple of examples of data being used to inform decision making, and talked about some approaches that the community can join us to get even better at connecting data with decisions and moving towards this outcome of shared informed stewardship. And with that, I'll say thank you and be happy to take any questions. Well, thanks, Brian. Um, you gave an example, uh, you know, of a 
data set that had been collected annually and now you're thinking every three years is fine. How many different species are there for which we, you collect, whether it's annual or some other regular periodic basis that you collect data on the, the prevalence of that species? I and mean, we're aware of things like raptors and bats, but I don't have a sense of how many different species you're actively tracking. Yeah, the total species list for plants, as I mentioned in the inventory, is over a thousand. So you and mean you actually track? Oh, I just thought you meant that's how many we've identified. Yeah, you're actually that's tracking? The, so that's the biggest sort of species pool we could con consider. Oh, okay. Um, how many of those are detected in grasslands versus forests versus riparian and wetlands? I don't have those numbers off the top of my head. Um, if you can fit 50 species in a 100 meter square area roughly, and then there's some level of turnover, so the next transect has another 50, but they're not all the same. So you'd start to kind of build a species pool that way of just the grassland transects we measured. So I could I, certainly get that number. I would estimate it's missing, gonna be uh, hundreds. I'm missing what you're saying. Are you answering Tom's question or a different question? I was just trying to figure out, maybe I'll restate it in case there was some confusion. Uh, how many different species are there for which we regularly go out and survey, whether it's on the system of the whole or some subset of the system, how prevalent that species is so that you could track, as you did for, I think it was a xeric tall grass prairie mosaic, you know, track um, the performance over time. Through a regular inventory. You know, the, the way we do have for, obviously, for just as example, for raptors, where you can really track it over time and see how that gotcha. species is doing. Yeah, and again, I don't have a number off the top of my head. I, we, there's a, several different ways to answer that question. The grassland transects themselves, there are 150 of them. And in those, we record whatever vascular plant species we encounter. And so it's not like we're going okay. to look for a hit list of 20 species um, through those transects. It's whatever's there. And that aggregation of species, it's hundreds, I would say. Then another way to answer it might be our list of rare plant species. How many of those are we tracking? So that would give you a different number. Another number we could produce is how many um, invasive plant species are we tracking? And those would be more like species-specific lists that we're actually kind of looking at one species at a time. So where we, th thank you, it gives me a sense of the magnitude of that undertaking. For something like an indicator species that we've identified for the health of a particular ecosystem, like I think Abert squirrels was the one for ponderosa pine forests, um, how many of those do we track how that species is doing? That's a good question. Because there's some for which that was, particularly in the West TSA, there was quite a big point about what is the right species to use for measuring as an indicator the health of a particular type of ecosystem. And mm -hmm. I don't know to what extent we sort of monitor, the, which, which of those we monitor, which ones we don't. Um, most of our monitoring is directed through the resource management plan. So, for example, what Brian was talking about with the, gra the grassland transects, that's what, what um, kind of how that derives. Uh, there are a number of other species, Tom, that we track regularly, uh, maybe not to the extent that we do the grassland transects, and that would be, uh, that would be things like our, our currently our focus has been on prairie dogs, of course, and where those are across the system, and we track that every year and map it every year. Um, another example would be um, uh, northern leopard frog, which you saw a presentation on recently where uh, we know where they're, we, every year we go out and we look at where they're breeding and where they're not breeding, and we have a, an understanding of how that's developing, and I think um, that was explained to you a couple of meetings ago of kind of how we're understanding that. Um, another example would be uh, Preble's meadow jumping mouse, which we will do, um, we'll, we'll monitor for presence and absence in a number of areas around the system on a routine basis. So those are just some examples. Labor squirrel, of course, um, we look more at in terms of um, protecting nests when we're going into working and uh, doing some forest work in an area. So, um, but and then there's you know a handful of others, but those are uh, I would say kind of some of our main focus. Also, um, nesting raptors and grasshopper sparrows. So ground nesting birds is another um, that we that we spend a lot of our time on. Thanks, John. Yep. It's helpful. 
I, I just want to thank you quickly. I was really uh, interested in your points about uh, efficiency of cost and actionability on um, the science data, uh, especially this idea of the build out of a website I'm fascinated by. The one um, question I have, uh, you know, when I do my own looking at some of the researches, uh, research work that sort of, you know, pertains to things we're looking at, it's always difficult to determine what uh, meets quality standards. And I'm just curious, as you just, you talked about utilizing outside research uh, in some of these cases, is there is there a department policy about how we, we separate the wheat from the chafe, so mm -hmm. to speak? That's a good question. I mean, the scientific environment, of course, uses the peer-reviewed process. So you take something that's published in a journal and there's some assumption that it's been carefully scrutinized by a group of peer reviewers and the journal's editor themselves. And so you want to take that as sort of your gold standard. Now that said, we don't assume that everything that's published is super high quality and we've had internal conversations as we review papers that have been published and we find flaws in those all the time and so you have to be careful even at that highest level of, of standard. But beyond that, um, I think you rely on your own scientific expertise and training and familiarity with the topic um, to evaluate somebody else's work. And that's really how peer review works in the first place. I might be reviewing a manuscript where it's got a statistical model that I'm really familiar with and so I'm gonna really focus on that while the next reviewer might be really interested in that species of interest. And so we each kind of come with our own expertise and we use that as our evaluation of the quality. Um, beyond that, I don't know if we have a best practice or a set of criteria um, that we would have. I don't think we have something like that. I'd be interested to hear if you had some thoughts of what that might look like. There's things like um, the rigor of the sample design would be something like if we see something that only has a sample size of two or 10 or 30, but so much of that is contingent upon a lot of other factors that it'd be hard to come up with single gold standards that would apply to each study we review, um, I would say. Yeah. Well, it's, I'm totally outside my experience, but I'd be delighted if we got to a place where the, the department library was one we all felt we could trust and, and, and utilize. Okay. Yeah. Ryan, I think that uh, one, another response to uh, Hale's question is that we've now accumulated enough experience in the larger research community, we have a pretty good understanding of, um, you know, certain people's expertise and qualifications. And so anytime that, you know, you um, ha have a research question that someone, you know, is interested in or you're interested in, in getting that uh, looked at, um, there is a pool out there of, of uh, tenured and experienced uh, researchers that I think have a history of of good work, and uh, so that's always reassuring as well. And I wanted to say a special thanks. I, I, this has been, uh, I think, extremely helpful um, and uh, uh, reassuring. Um, the one question I have, Brian, is uh, so how are you, or how, how are folks working with the, the education and community outreach group as far as, you know, incorporating or integrating the, some of this information into, you know, the programs that uh, we're providing the school groups and community, uh, you know, the community at large? Yeah, I think that's a great area for improvement and there's a lot of opportunity there. And I would look at the master plan implementation as potentially one of the very best places as we approach implementing the strategies and building teams and making sure those teams have a subject matter experts and education and outreach staff. Part of the web page I mentioned here, um, I've directly resourced education and outreach staff to make sure any messages we're putting out there are the same messages they're delivering in their program. Climate change is a great one where they're starting to tell a story for the Department on Climate Change and we want to make sure we're all integrated in terms of our understanding of what the science says and what the impacts might look like, where the uncertainty is, and how we kind of think about it across all of our charter purposes. Um, but I would say to date, it's been somewhat informal, but it comes together through um, some of our integrated site planning, for example, at Gun Barrel Hill, where we've got education outreach, giving presentations, 
based on data and based on subject matter expertise, but in a way that's digestible um, for the neighbors and community to understand it. So they're a real asset to us to help us take something that can seem fairly nuanced and complicated and simplify it into what the average visitor could understand and care about. Um, and at the same time, I think we can we can do even better going forward, especially in those areas like climate change, but also um, visitor capacity. Mm -hmm. uh, that, that's an area, that. Yeah, that's an area where we're trying to take from the informal status to the formal status, and I think the master plan implementation, institutionalizing master plan implementation is really going to do one of the things that we've been talking with the uh, education outreach folks on is being proactive in terms of identifying projects that might be two or three or four years down the road and how we can get education and outreach to do upfront work on a project that we might not actually arrive on on a site in two mm -hmm. or three years but there's a lot of great prep work with working with the community or with neighborhoods on, on work we know we're going to be doing in that area. So we're asking education and outreach as well as our communication staff and others that are involved in, in proactively looking at projects that are on the slate, either coming out later that year or ideally two or three years down the road and starting to identify those projects where we ought to, we ought to formalize that alignment with getting education and outreach out, out in front. So. It has been a little bit informal, a lot of, a lot of here and there, and one of the uh, ways of institutionalizing the implementation of the master plan is how can we kind of create this whole strategy of, of lining up a project over a series of years. I think tall oak grass was one where, uh, was an example of this year where we had education outreach and Lori, Lori Dieter and some of the education staff out there uh, working on education stuff on the tall oak grass ahead of a project that we'll actually start to see on the ground implementation of, so. Yeah, no, that sounds great. And uh, one other thing, I think the open houses of, of late, you know, have been a good forum for presenting, you know, information. And I think Tall Oak Grass, uh, the open house last week uh, was a good example of that where people came and, you know, were knowledgeable, informed, uh, concerned, and uh, the conversations, I think, were, were um, much more informed um, because of some of the work that uh, we did, you know, in preparation for that. Mm -hmm. I'll just put a little bit of hint. Uh, in the coming months, I'm not sure exact when education and outreach will uh, present to you some of their strategic thinking about how to look at sites uh, uh, within the system and incorporating the themes to those sites. And one of the themes could be is what are those on, on the ground management challenges that we're wrestling with and, and how they would take those themes and make it into education and outreach programming. So you'll hear a little bit about that in the coming months. Great. We look forward to that. Yeah, and I, I agree. I think that's a very uh, constructive direction. Um, I want to pursue a little bit further the, Brian, you mentioned strengthening communication uh, with the community about this kind of, of information. And um, my reaction to some of the suggestions that you had to do that w sounded to me more like preaching to the choir rather than to reaching additional diverse members of the community. And um, I, it seems to me that, as with other things, People would understand better the research if it was part of a field trip right. and they got to see what was actually done out on the land and what kind of data was collected and then what was done with that data in a field trip context, which again begs this kind of collaboration between the researchers and the education staff. Um, and the other thing that you had on your uh, slide was videos, and of course that kind of field trip could be videoed for people who didn't go on the field trip. But I'd like to see a lot more of that strengthening communication with the community done in real time out on the land yep. to the degree that it can. Um, the other two questions that I have have to do with um, the inventories you described. I now understand that you were describing the vegetative transects or whatever you call them, the, the blocks that you transect regularly, the monitoring of those. 
and in addition to the, those monitoring studies over decades, um, you have, I think, 400 studies in the library. And I know from the BCNA symposia that you've had some grad students go back in and deconstruct some of those and learn from the data that's been gathered in various ways. I'm wondering how much of that kind of work is left to be done to learn from the data sets and the work that's already be, been done. Because it seems to me that may be a very rich repository that could inform us in real ways. Is that true or not? Yeah. Yeah, I, and I would say the way I think about it is there's a bit of a backlog in terms of analysis and synthesis. Um, and there's a lot of work to be done in that area, and some are long-term data sets. Some we've had uh, four years of data, but we just haven't had time to really put it all together. So that's one of the things the science team is working on is if we conceive that there's a backlog in reporting, what are some solutions that we can take to solve the backlog? And one of the things we're trying, in addition to finding graduate students and postdocs to analyze mm -hmm. our data for us for a small amount of money, um, is the concept of a data sprint, a data science sprint, which is a guaranteed amount of time that we give to staff to set aside from their normal business to just look at their data, and they have support from me and a couple other staff members to overcome any hurdles that they perceive in terms of the data. A lot of times there's roadblocks there in terms of getting data out, combining it with the other kinds of information you need, putting in climate information, doing the statistical models, surviving through all those steps mm -hmm. and not getting fatigued and distracted. So by giving a, a single block of time just to do an acceleration um, on one particular data set at a time, that's something we're trying. We've heard staff is interested in that and um, we're doing our first one right now actually. So we're, we're trying things like that to add value to those assets because that's what they are is assets mm -hmm. that I think we've undervalued to date. Um, and so we can expect, if we're successful, we'll, we'll start to uh, chip away at that backlog. And a, are there also perhaps possibilities of repeating something again later, like 10 years later or something, rather than constructing a new protocol from scratch? Yeah, I think there's a lot of opportunity there, and it's a question of how good the metadata is, which is the data yep. about the data. Yep. If you have a data set, but you don't have a data set that describes where, when, who, why, how, and if those sample locations were monumented or at least GPSed, that'll sort of determine whether you can go back there. Yep. And oftentimes, the longer, the more time that elapsed between the last time we went there, the ecosystem starts to eat those things and you can't relocate stuff. It's kind of a fascinating process. So rebar just goes further, further down into the soil and the caps disappear. But the opportunity is there as long as we have that information to tell us where to go and relocate the samples. There, as you're describing that, I think of an invasive study that was done by some university in Utah um, down prior to the Springbrook Loop trails going in. And um, because of our problems with invasives, those kinds of things seem to me like they might be fruitful things to repeat. Um, my final question has to do with your comment about statistically valid surveys versus in informal questionnaires. And I have to tell you that my personal opinion given the way that the community of Boulder receives data from statistically significant questionnaires um, as opposed to informal uh, questionnaires is that, I, I don't know what the cost differential is, and you may know that, but no matter, to me, no matter what the cost differential, I would rather have less frequent statistically significant surveys Okay. rather than spending time on informal questionnaires because the community discounts informal questionnaires because they know they're rife with problems and lack of data. Okay. Do you have any sense of the difference in cost? 
Well, questionnaires can almost be free, other than the time it takes staff to write up a questionnaire and publish it through a web And analyze it, yeah. yeah. So there's staff time there. Mark, uh, we have a master plan survey data. I know, um, it's Five. around about 50,000 for a full-blooded <laughs> statistical survey using a consultant. Um, and that also, that doesn't include staff time, like someone like Dion or Brian analyzing the data from the consultant. It would or would not include staff? It doesn't include that, yeah. that's just a standalone cost. So obviously an informal questionnaire is just a matter of staff time figuring it out. But you're right, Karen, there is a big difference between the two. I think Brian was trying to point towards where we might be looking for sort of a smaller response rate on a perhaps a less controversial or scientific subject sometimes. Thanks, Mark. Thanks. Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you, Brian. Well, that's great yeah, stuff. Thanks, Brian. Dan, All right, Tom, I'll turn it over things to you. All right, so the first item under matters from the board is our response to council's questions on priorities. Uh, Kurt and I, uh, and frankly more Kurt than I, uh, but we did collaborate on uh, a draft set and uh, those have been, those are in the packet so the public has access to them. Um, Leah, do you, do you have the ability to put that up on the screen? I think we probably all have copies of it, but and then I know Hal, you had, um, and maybe that's the better place to start because uh, you had a proposed significant edit. And maybe to put Hal's edit up and have you, you know, just talk through what it is you're, what you're driving at, and then um, see, where see, see where we are. Great. Um, yeah, I, I thought in general uh, it was excellent and painted the, the picture of what we're up against in the next year very well. Um, I personally feel at this juncture after approving the master plan, a significant budgetary shift away from acquisitions and towards management and maintenance that um, a discussion and reiteration of uh, the newly reauthorized sales tax and the specific usages, uh, particularly pertaining to backlog maintenance, um, is important. Um, I think after listening to the City Council study session uh, last night about macro budget issues, uh, it's doubly important that we paint the picture of um, usage and maintenance on our lands as uh, a very important and long-term investment. Um, we know, uh, you know, due to staff's reporting that uh, we have quite a back backlog in maintenance. And so the general thrust of this language is to reiterate the uh, master plan points that were assigned the largest dollar uh, value and importance in the plan and um, to also make clear um, that the sales tax reauthorization um, is really not about funding ambitious visionary plans but is really about um, the maintenance on an uh, uh, asset that, I mean, at its absolute most conservative estimate is a $5 billion plus system. Um, so that was the, the general thrust of essentially taking what was item number three and moving it to number one. Um, and then the language just specifically bullet pointed those items from the master plan which had the large dollar values associated with it. Um, basically in the hopes that reiteration uh, attracts attention. So um, I don't uh, disagree with the way you've characterized the issue. The question I have is where council is actually going to fit into this within the time frame that we're talking about. I mean, certainly the way Kurt and I had drafted it was just to remind them that this will be picked up in the budget, which unquestionably is an issue that council uh, has to tackle. Beyond the budget, I'm not, and this is, and staff may have some, pers you know, valuable perspective as well on what's going to council and what's not, but I'm not sure what master plan implementation steps uh, would actually go to council in this time frame. I mean, I, I, they can always call up whatever they wish, but I mean, just in the normal course, I'm not sure what we would be doing on the implementation side, but you may, but uh, how that, would, that would actually go to council. Isn't, isn't your point that the, the tax, passage of the tax measure and the implementation of the master plan 
will be reflected in the budget that we advance to council and that they should be able to see in the budget that they re that's recommended by uh, OSMP and OSBT those changes? Yeah, I think that's fair. I mean, the, the big tension I see is that right at this point where we suggested we are moving to a management and maintenance focused uh, budget, we have this one final amazing easement deal. And I just think that the way those two things inter interact in our reiteration of the high dollar items in the master plan um, makes may, may, it basically makes the highest level importance. N not to, to say that the Prairie Dogs and South Boulder Creek um, and CU South are are not important items. They very much are. But I just think from a longer term perspective, the shift from acquisitions to uh, maintenance and backlog is, is a pretty big element of, of what we're doing. Sure. So maybe this would resolve the potential confusion I was having is in the very first line, um, we'll seek council support. Would, if it said that we'll seek council support of the budget, because I think that's actually the, what council, yes, the other things build up to the budget, but I don't think we're going to be asking them at any other level of detail to yeah. bless an implementation plan. It'll all be in the budget. So if you said we'll seek su council support of a, uh, of the, uh, well. Of the 2021 20, FY, of the FY 2021 budget. That, that sounds fair to me. Okay. Yeah, no, I think that's a good suggestion. Mm -hmm. Uh, because they've already approved the, the master plan, so theoretically they've supported that. So now it's the budget that, you know, we're talking about. Yep. Mm -hmm. And I think, again, from my perspective, it's worth letting council know what those high priorities are that, you know, the budget will be reflecting. Um, because I do think, you know, based on uh, a brief uh, listening to the council conversation at the study session last night, that there is great concern about, you know, kind of the long, the long term, or as uh, some of them put it, the, you know, the macro uh, vision of, um, of where we're going and what the costs are. And I think we want to make sure that we highlight that there's some really urgent, vital uh, issues that we've, we've got to be addressing. And then I think in two and three, you know, we kind of tease out what some of the, those are actually specifically for the near term. So, and Leah, can, I think when you said 20, it should say FY 2021, the 2020 mm -hmm. budget is that's already, right. yeah. So that's just, it should say FY 2021. Okay. Um, okay. Were there other, I wasn't sure from your note whether there were other uh, changes you're proposing, or is it all captured in number one? That, that, that's okay. pretty much, it was okay. basically to take number three, wh which was a yep. little bit shorter, bump it to number one and just add a little more right. detail. Okay. Yep. I'm good. Um, could I ask a question um, of, of the board? Um, so one of my, um, one of the, the values that I see in providing a piece like this is, not so much whether they choose to make one of ours a council priority, but it's you know it's an educational tool, mm -hmm. especially for a 50% new council. This is an opportunity for us to you know educate them on certain things, and I'm I'm a little concerned that we are self-selecting in this a top master plan funding priorities and listing four that that or four that really had no vetting or no process. We have approved through a, a formal vetting process, top, top 10 top, um, uh, top tier, top tier priorities. And I think that if we, it, which they may, half of them may not even know what those 10 were. And here they might look and say, oh, these are the top four master plan funding priorities. When in reality we have 10 top, fun, uh, top priorities. And, are, are and, and I'm a little concerned we didn't sort of go through any sort of process in identifying which four we choose out of those 10 to put in here. So, so the, the process that was undertaken was looking at the ones that had the most dollar signs associated with mm -hmm. them? No, I think they're the ones that have the ones next to them, right? 
the priority one. I guess that, that that's why I formed my statement of more in form of a question, like how did we, you know, I'm not sure how these four got arrived at and whether or not there's value in saying and not naming our top tier or whether to see if you guys all agree that these are our top uh, or just. Well, uh, to, to answer the question, they were, they were pulled from the ones that had the most dollar signs associated from the master plan. And um, they, I, I think the, the essence of what I'm trying to get across here um, was captured sort of, Councilman Yates talked about the difference between items that are blocking and tackling and visionary elements. My main hope through pulling these out was to communicate the blocking and tackling efforts that we have on this system. Mm -hmm. um, I'm totally open to any changes or, or alterations, um, but th that was basically how they were selected. So uh, based on the, the top number of resources, dollars, and other, that would take to accomplish that, that's how these, these were identified? Yeah, associated okay. with the, the number of dollar symbols that were attached to the highest priority items. Yeah, they were in the they were in the the funding chapter mm -hmm. of the plan, and uh, yeah, it was. I'm not. I, I guess I don't know that the, um, that they're necessarily the the. Well, no, I won't say that. I I don't know that uh, putting ten there will be m more helpful. Dan, yeah. I guess uh, you know it's a matter of you know here are you know here's kind of a, a collection of 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 them. Um, if I think if we get too many, you know you're kind of going to do the eye roll of geez, you know you're you're trying to you know yeah. just to kind of do the the core dump and uh, yeah. This was just an attempt, I think. Uh, on, on Hal's part to, to identify, you know, some of those that, you know, are, are among the highest priorities. So uh, following that, may, I wonder if it wouldn't be better to say top master funding priorities targeted for 2021 include rather than are, so it doesn't sound like we're making a definitive statement, but in, include may accomplish what you're seeking to do while recognizing, I think there were nine, it might have been ten, um, yeah, uh, two, yeah, 10 uh, tier one priorities. I think there were three from EHR and yep. maybe th three from. I'm 100% uh, okay. okay to that. Okay. Yep. The, the, main, the main hope is sure. we, we experienced a very close call with serious funding volatility for the department. And I just think for new council members, everybody involved, painting the picture of the real ongoing cost of managing a $5 billion plus system is, is really helpful. So, did anyone have any other? I I like your suggestion okay. of include, and um, I see them as much more digestible than a accurate list of quoting mm -hmm. uh, the nine that had number one priority on them. Um, you know, we could. I, I could edit, <laughs> but I'll let that it's, stand. Right, it's, um, because I think they convey the essence of, of some of the most important funding priorities that are defined in the master plan. Okay. So, uh, sounds like that is good to go to council, um, uh, which I think it's due Friday. And, and we're talking about leaving... I think all the rest of it is probably the... Unless someone else has changes, the rest of it will all be exactly what um, was circulated the other day. I have it's flipping three and one. Yes, yeah, so then two and three would be in the order, would, would be the former one and two, and then the piece okay. at the end about the three ISPs. Mm -hmm. okay, so flipping the three and two? Well, that is, oh, the way it's on the screen is correct. Yeah. Yes. Right. Okay. And, and Tom, does this still, does this all in, include this? The other item that's below the three, uh, I believe it was items for council for council information. information. Yeah, that, that would yeah, still be part still of that. The then may I suggest one wording change <laughs> in that? <laughs> um, uh, in the bot, uh, the first paragraph, the last word, it said uh, more will generate requests for a council hearing. Um, often, if uh, council is not involved in actually making a decision, they'll, we will put it under matters. Uh, from the city manager. Um, Prairie Dogs was under matters through the whole thing. So 
it just to, we'll, we'll generate requests for council consideration fine, or something yeah. like that. Uh, or can't council involvement or and then just the hearing the prior is line get rid of a instead of 4a just request for council consideration doesn't have to be a hearing thank you all right thanks all right great so let's see the next is uh notification of upcoming public participation events i think with the movement of the master plan rollout from january to as a, and as yet unidentified date in february i don't think there's anything that we need to notify between now and our meeting in january january yeah that's correct okay uh, the next item I wanted to spend a couple minutes on, although people may wish to talk about it in greater detail, was to at least initially raise the question of a board retreat. There's been some expression of interest, and particularly with Kurt not here, I wouldn't propose to try to reach any definite decision, but I wanted to at least float the issue for people to consider and maybe then plan on during the January meeting coming to a final decision on whether people think it would be useful to have a retreat and if so you know when and what would be the, the subject matter of a retreat it has been a number of years since the board has had a retreat and we're probably close to a situation where um, the majority of the vast majority of the board has not had a chance to sort of sit down and um, you know I think uh, it is worthwhile for a board to periodically get together kind of off-site, it's still a public meeting, but kind of off-site in a more casual setting to discuss issues, many of which are frankly just sort of board functioning issues and now are, you know, what do people feel is working well and what things need to be done differently and to have a chance to talk through those. Often there's a presentation from uh, maybe the city attorney's office to review certain basic things about, you know, document retention, public meetings, rules, just to, you know, kind of remind us all of those. And there may be, you know, some substantive issue that people also would like staff to, you know, kind of lead a discussion on, but that's, at least to my mind, is not the central purpose of a retreat. We typically do those, you know, in our regular monthly meetings. Um, uh, you know, we'll presumably have another board member in April, um, so at least to my mind, it would make more sense to wait uh, for that rather than to try to rush um, to get a retreat done only to, you know, ha have that change occur. So um, I don't want to be the person who's sort of leading the charge on this because it's really much more about what you all would feel would be useful, but I did want to, at minimum, float the issue. Um, see if there are initial reactions, but also, you know, give people a chance to, you know, go home and ponder it and then come back in January ready to, you know, make a firm decision on whether you want to hold a retreat and if so, when and what will, you know, what kind of topics you would like to have prepared for discussion. I can only think of one small topic that I would advocate to get on that agenda, but my thinking is similar to yours, that I think of a retreat as a way to incorporate a new board member and start a new term with, you know, new people on the board. So I would think one in April would be good. Yeah, I definitely support that. I think, you know, having an opportunity to get together informally, uh, you know, for conversations uh, is, is excellent and uh, is very productive um, and uh, you know there I'm sure there will be issues or topics that we, we can uh, we can consider for the agenda but I think it's very beneficial f for us to get together in a more informal uh, way and off-site and you know just kind of have a little more relaxed environment uh, to talk about things yeah I'd be delighted okay so it sounds like there's likely to be ma at least majority support to do that. And so maybe in January, um, people will have their count and that gives- You're thinking of setting aside a date before we start making our spring personal plans. Well, I thought, does that, <laughs> because, does that work? Because we're yeah. talking about a date other than the second Wednesday, right? Yes. 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 Yep. Yeah. And so uh, if hopefully, you know, would, it's January 8th, it's actually not, it's, 
you know, very soon after the new year. Does that, yeah, I don't know if there's any ask of council, I mean, of the board, other than uh, us to decide on topics and for staff, right. you know, kind of to think about dates. So our director's team meets tomorrow, in fact, in what we call agenda setting meetings. So we look at the board meetings over the next three months, council, all staff meetings, and we plug in certain things. So why don't we take a look at some date scenarios for what I'm kind of thinking is, right, no later than early May, but April, early May kind of thing, and maybe we could come in January with, with some potential dates that might work. Um, and I think, Dan, uh, you know, some suggestions or topics, you know, that you might, th or people might find yep. helpful? Yep, what I was also going to suggest is perhaps in January, if you guys want to appoint a liaison, that could then work, because we might have, here's a collection of six or seven things that we would, as a staff, we feel are useful, and bounce it off of a, 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 a board liaison who could kind of, and then come back at a later date to kind of flush out an agenda. And, and one topic I would just recommend for your consideration because it reflects a fairly significant change in the last few years from how this board has operated, which is uh, lately we've been drafting a fair number of fairly detailed statements to council. And there are pros and cons to that. I'm unambiguously a pro is that it allows us to provide more information to council in some context and make, rather than just a simple motion that might only be one sentence long, I think it does convey a lot more information and there's value in that. There's an obvious downside, which is some of these have taken a great deal of time for this board to craft and the board, you know, I think understandably is pretty careful on its language and I'm sure people have watched us sometimes perhaps <laughs> painfully, but regardless, <laughs> just honestly, you know, kind of wrestling with how exactly to say something yep. and on some of these topics, and it's probably not the last time we're going to make a statement on something like South Boulder Creek, um, probably on Prairie Dogs either, uh, that, you know, uh, it does represent a significant change in the way we didn't used to do that. And I think it's probably worth the board having a discussion about, you know, how that's working and maybe get some candid feedback from staff on their own impressions of seeing both the positives of some, I think, some very good output, but also some challenging process as we, you know, people sit up here and try to work their way through a potentially lengthy document. So I would just encourage, because I think that is uh, has been a change in the last two to three years from a fairly long-standing prior practice. And I think that would be, that topic would be very useful as we kind of enter into the South Boulder Creek Prairie Dog, you know, issues, um, you know, kind of later or early mid been part of next year so that, you know, we have a conversation. I think it would be, it, would be or would have been really good to have just a, a conversation amongst ourselves on South Boulder Creek issues, you know, and kind of, gee, you, what do you think? So that rather than being in a formal setting, you know, and having to kind of talk through it, we would have a chance to, you know, just talk am amongst ourselves and get a better understanding of, uh, you know, where people are coming from and what uh, people think are, you know, things that we really need to be <laughs> And I have to say, Tom, that as you said, because you're having seen the shift in the pre and the post practice, I think it would be very helpful for us to have your perception of the pros and cons of both ways of doing okay. it. Okay, sure. Um, so I wasn't proposing to do that now, but yeah, it, yep. it, it is a way of <laughs> communicating that. Um, and then there may be other things that people, it just occurs to people on how we, you know, how we do things. Candidly, I think this board is somewhat less formal than a lot of other boards in the way we do things. I think it's worked well, but I, again, that's not a given that that's the right way. And I think that people should always feel free if they'd like to someday go back to a, you know, a more formal way of doing things and, mm -hmm. you know, just not always assume that the way we do things is the right way. 
All right, and Hal, I know you had a matter from the board issue that you oh, wanted yeah. to raise? Uh, not so much an issue as a or celebration. A comment. Uh, okay. um, I just wanted to thank staff members for hosting such an amazing uh, volunteer celebration. Um, it was really remarkable to see all the different people and programs um, that are getting volunteerism. Um, I have to say, when we talk about science and all the other ways we engage people, it's really clear that volunteering for the department is the real way that you get involved. Um, and so I just really wanted to thank you for hosting such a nice evening. And also, uh, to you know, Ray, you come to our meetings every evening. Um, your book on the geology of uh, Boulder County was the most sought after item. I realize it's, it's selling for $125 on Amazon, so it's no wonder people <laughs> were trying to get it. Um, but in any case, uh, thank you so much for doing that. I hope we keep that tradition up, and I feel, I'm feel sure that everybody there really felt the same way, so thank you. Um, any other matters from anyone else on the board? It, no? If I could just sure. uh, let you know, uh, you typically will get your packets on the Wednesday Wednesday late afternoon before that happens to be January 1st. So Leah, when do we expect to have board packets go out? <laughs> <laughs> just to give you that. Not on the first slide. Like you may only have right? six days to review your packet in this case. Look, I think it's that Friday we were looking at. Okay, it'll either be January 2nd or 3rd is when we'll get the packets out oh, to you. Sorry, yeah, the 2nd, if we can, the, yeah, we can swing it, it's that Thursday. It's the 2nd Thursday? Mm -hmm. Yeah. But oh, we could still get the hard copy on Friday. Yeah, or, yeah. or yeah. Thursday, Friday at the latest, and we'll get it posted on the web. And, right. But we won't be in on New Year's Day to do that for you. I think that's what we're saying. How unreasonable. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so um, are we adjourned? All right, we're adjourned. Thank you.